All right, at this time, will all sergeants please start your recording? Sergeant Martinez, you may begin with your opening statement. Good, good afternoon and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Veterans. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or to silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Thank you. Uh, great to see everyone. Good morning. My name is uh, Councilman Mechaim Deitch, Chair of the Committee on Veterans. And I would like to welcome everyone today to today's virtual oversight hearing on veterans' needs during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the veterans community faces the same issues as the broader community in the midst of this difficult time. Uh, though with additional burdens that many in the general population do not face. Like many New Yorkers, uh, veterans must uh, grapple with heightened concerns surrounding housing, food insecurity, and the effects of social isolation, as well as the health concerns posed by the virus itself. However, they also deal with numerous conditions resulting from their service, particular conditions that may increase the risk of contracting COVID-19 and having to na navigate a complicated network of service providers. Uh, today, we will seek uh, to gain clarity regarding the Department of Veteran Services, ongoing work and pro-specific information related to the department's uh, operations during COVID-19 pandemic. As the central connector between city services and our veterans community, DVS serves as a critical role in directing um, our former service members to much needed resources and support systems. It is thus essential for us to gain a thorough understanding of exactly how it is filling this role and servicing our veterans so that we might work together in the common interest of being serving, uh, serving the veterans in the greater New York City area. Uh, the committee thanks the administration um, advocates and stakeholders for being present and testifying today. And we hope to hear from both sides on these issues to improve them to the best to best serve and protect our veterans and i would like to acknowledge and welcome um any of my colleagues so hold on one second okay any of my colleagues on i can't mr chair if you could just hold for one moment we had a little issue with the recording uh we're just gonna get the uh backup going Okay, sorry for that. We're good to go. Apologies. Any of my colleagues on? Because I can't see the full screen. Hold on. Oh, we have a uh, council member, Alan Mazel, uh, who is with us, council member Amprey uh, Samuel, uh, Elite Amprey Samuel. Okay, and I think that is who we have here so far. And I'd like to thank my staff, uh, Tova Chasanoff, my deputy chief of staff, uh, Joe Bello, my director of veterans affairs. And I would also like to thank the committee whose staff, uh, the committee uh, staff who helped prepare for this hearing, uh, Ismail Sharif and Thomas Nate. Uh, the council will now administer the oath. Council. I can, I think he's muted. Uh, thank you, Chair Deutsch. I'm oh, Ishmael Sharif, Counsel to the Veterans Committee of the New York City Council. I'll be moderating today's hearing. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, when you will be unmuted by the host. I'll be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be, 
Uh, the first three panelists will be members of the administration, DVS Commissioner James Hendon, uh, with Vincent Garcia, Intergovernmental Affairs Director, and Quimid Francis, Deputy Chief of Staff, present for questions. I will call you when it is your turn to speak. Uh, during the hearing, if council members would like to ask questions, please use the raise hand function in Zoom and I will call you in the order we will, uh, we will be limiting council members questions to five minutes, including answers. Uh, please also note that for ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questioning. Thank you. I will now administer the oath. Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth uh, before the committee and to respond honestly to CM questions. Uh, we will go by each member of DVS, starting with James Hendon, commissioner. I do. Vincent Garcia. I do, yes, sir. Quimid Francis. I do. Thank you. Uh, you may begin when ready, Chair. Oh, excuse me, you may begin when ready, uh, administration. Thank you. I'm sorry, Ishmael, uh, do we uh, also need to swear in uh, our associate commissioner, Cassandra Alvarez? I actually didn't get Cassandra Alvarez as of the this morning, but we can swear her in as well. Is she going to be testifying today? Yes, um, she is. Yeah, she's been part of this. Is she also on the Zoom? Yes, she is. Okay, Cassandra, do you swear or affirm to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hey, um, thank you so much, uh, Ishmael. Uh, uh, good afternoon, Chairman Deutsch, mem committee members and advocates. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to recognize the more than 215,000 lives that we've lost in our city, state, and country due to the pandemic. Uh, it has been an unprecedented and challenging year in New York City. Uh, but for those veterans in attendance, I would like to say that our agency stands ready to serve you in your time of need. My name is James Hendon. Uh, I am proud to serve as the commissioner for the New York City Department of Veteran Services. I'm joined today by Cassandra Alvarez, our associate commissioner for policy and strategic partnerships, uh, and Kwamit Francis, our deputy chief of staff. I welcome this opportunity to testify about Vet Connect NYC, food insecurity, uh, VA claims, employment, housing assistance, and our COVID-19 response. Uh, following my testimony, I welcome all questions that you may have. Now, when the pandemic first struck the city in March and our, our new reality set in, you know, DVS, like other agencies, began working from home to protect its staff and constituents. Uh, through those first tumultuous days, DVS staff continued answering phone calls, communicating with constituents, and providing benefits and services. Uh, despite not knowing whether the pandemic would last for weeks, months, or, or even years, DVS began developing a proactive plan to continue providing the highest quality of care to our constituents, understanding that the demand for our services would be in greater need than ever. Uh, we deployed our continuation of operations plan on March 16th, mandating all staff to perform their duties from the safety of their homes, limiting external work to essential appointments and duties that otherwise could not be done remotely. The continuation of operations plan or the COOP plan would also serve as our blueprint to create new and innovative approaches that address the specific needs arising from or exacerbated by the crisis, such as food, as housing, food insecurity, and employment assistance. The transition from military to civilian life that veterans undergo can be isolating, challenging, and can take a lifetime. This can lead to veterans experiencing profound social isolation even prior to the COVID-19 crisis. Mission Vet Check is a collaboration between DVS, Thrive NYC and veteran service organizations, uh, veteran serving organizations, including the New York National Guard and the Mission Continues. This initiative was developed to help reduce social isolation for veterans and is addressing veterans' needs during the pandemic. VetCheck is designed to offer New York City's veterans support and connection to the veteran community during this crisis, as well as immediate information about essential public services, including free meals. COVID-19 te test site locations, and mental health resources. VetCheck trains volunteers from New York City's veteran community to make compassionate check-in calls to other veterans. Training is delivered by DVS and Thrive NYC, and volunteer management is overseen and conducted by New York Cares. 
since April 23rd, through Mission Vet Check, DVS has placed over 17,000 calls to New York City veterans, resulting in about 630 referrals to DVS. When a caller is unable to assist a veteran directly, their issue is automatically transferred to a service request for our agency. Uh, these referrals range from mental health support, VA claims, food and employment and security, and financial assistance with an average completion time within 48 hours. Uh, veterans can also be referred to DVS for additional resources and support such as housing, benefits, or healthcare needs. Uh, despite these uncertain times, Mission Vet Check serves as an outlet to inform, empower, and bond our community together throughout the pandemic. Uh, one of the largest concerns facing New Yorkers during the pandemic is food insecurity. To, act, to address this need, DVS has partnered with Get Food NYC to ensure that our veteran populations are able to access all the avenues through which the city is providing food assistance to New Yorkers. To support these efforts, DVS coordinators received training and certification as Get Food authorized enrollers and are assisting veterans in navigating the requirements of this program to get food. Veterans can independently or through one of our DVS coordinators submit a food request once every three days or two weeks uh, for uh, recurring orders. Our work to address food insecurity goes well beyond Get Food NYC. Our outreach and strategic partnerships teams were able to direct food assistance, food resources to veterans in need through close collaboration with valued community partners. Through our relationship with the Bob Woodruff Foundation, DVS worked with Italians Feed America, an organization founded by celebrity chef Fabrizio Pacini, to deliver $10,000 worth of cooking ingredients to veteran food pantries in Queens. Further, in connection with the New York State Division uh, for Veteran Services and the Campaign Against Hunger, DVS staff and a core of dedicated volunteers were able to provide meals to veterans across the five boroughs. Collectively, these organizations are working together to distribute 350 to 400 HelloFresh food kits to veteran households per week through the end of the year. To date, 10,000 meals have been provided directly to veterans through this partnership. Further, in addition to the HelloFresh initiative, DVS is also actively engaged with the Bronx Food Initiative to deliver meals to constituents. Uh, through this court collaboration, DVS has been able to distribute 3,100 meal boxes comprising of 12,400 meals. As we continue to develop internal programs and initiatives, DVS looks forward to continuing to collaborate with outside organizations to combat food insecurity facing our constituency. Just wanna clarify one thing here, it's 350 to 400 Get Food NYC meals that are being delivered. It's uh, approximately 2,000 uh, you know, HelloFresh food meal bags being delivered, and it's approximately 1,200 food boxes being delivered from the Bronx. So 350 to 400 for Get Food NYC, uh, approximately 2,000 bags uh, coming out of Brooklyn, and uh, 1,200 boxes coming out of the Bronx. Uh, switching on to Vet Connect. On October 1st, Vet Connect NYC entered its next chapter as we transitioned this program to the, agent, to the agency internally, resulting in an in-house model of providing care coordination services. We have established the Care Coordination Center within DVS, which we are certain will result in improved efficiency, direct connection with community and cost savings. Throughout the number of hearings we've had on this subject, it was no surprise that Vet Connect NYC has had a positive impact on veterans' lives. It provided a one-stop shop for veterans seeking assistance for a number of services. In fact, as we are all aware, a veteran often comes in for a single issue and through examination of such an issue, several others are identified. Further, Vet Connect NYC has served as a resource that bridges the divide between looking for a service and knowing where to go. However, a common goal that our nonprofit partners and constituents shared was efficiency and connectivity. The portal had become difficult to navigate and understand which services were still accepting clients and which were unable to. Uh, in addition, organizational restructuring at DVS created an opportunity for our, our outreach team to directly engage and serve our community through this care coordination work. In co coordination with Northwell Health, DVS outreach and engagement staff became trained in the care coordination center's operation. Through this collaboration with Northwell, DVS can maintain the excellent level of care provided by Northwell while addressing the concerns brought by constituents, nonprofits, and our agency alike. 
This adjustment will also improve our agency's access to system data, enabling us to analyze community needs and identify service trends in real time so we can respond and plan as necessary. As we bring VetConnect in-house, five DVS employees and one supervisor will staff the Care Coordination Center. This transformation will allow DVS to provide additional services for constituents, address and prioritize requests on a more reasonable basis, collect data to improve services, and decrease the program's overall cost to taxpayers. In, in achieving this change, we thank the number of nonprofits who have testified on the issue, the council, and of course, DVS staff. We're grateful for the dexterity, expertise, and empathy these staff members have shown to New York City veterans. We look forward to maintaining the care and attentiveness uh, veterans have come to expect when using the VetConnect NYC platform. Consistent with our goal of knowing where our veterans are at all times, DVS undertook an active wellness check on top of our existing efforts towards recently sheltered veterans. With over 900 veterans sheltered since the start of our agency, DVS has reached out to each veteran to provide a personal touch and check-in with some of our most vulnerable constituents. To accomplish this initiative, DVS staff members made phone calls to all formerly homeless veterans that were placed with DVS assistance since 2015 for a check-in. Uh, through these check-in calls, DVS's housing staff informed these veterans about services and benefits for which they may be eligible due to the pandemic, such as supportive services for veteran families, rental assistance, and the HCR, in New York State Rent Relief Open Application Time, all of which uh, providing, uh, all, of, all the time, providing a positive and supportive environment to listen and assist. Because DVS understands that the pandemic is creating greater housing insecurity, we have been actively housing homeless veterans throughout this pandemic to ensure that our veterans are in safe, secure housing. While our veteran peer coordinators, or VPCs, are no longer in city shelters, they continue to house veterans. Housing viewings and interviews were shifted to virtual modes, uh, video of available units were shared and management companies opted to complete phone or video call interviews with potential veteran applicants. Uh, when necessary and virtual options were not sufficient, the VPCs have continued to conduct inspections of units, pick up and drop off documentation and assist with uh, the veterans move. Over 40, with over 40 new HUDVASH continuum vouchers issued, since the start of this year, DVS has housed 65 veterans since March of 2020. Further, we continue to partner and refer veterans for any units that turn over and or become available in the Surf Vets property, which opened in Brooklyn in July of 2019. Despite the ongoing pandemic, B DVS was able to house 183 veterans in fiscal year 2020, an increase of approximately 18%. However, you know, directly referring veterans into supportive housing is just one piece of the puzzle. To assist in the successful transition from the shelter to new housing, also known as aftercare, all veterans who are successfully, ho successfully housed through the HUD-VASH Continuum Program are referred to a, a partner organization, Help USA's Veterans Aftercare Provo Program, to receive case management for a critical period of time uh, the six months after they are housed. Referrals are made once a veteran has been linked to housing and is uh, approaching a move from shelter. Since going remote on March 17th, 2020, DVS has referred 55 veterans to the Help Veterans to the Help USA Veterans Aftercare Program, thereby ensuring that more veterans are receiving HUD-VASH continuum vouchers, supporting and protecting our veterans. As we continue to partner and work with the four New York City grantees for supportive services for veteran families, that is Help USA, uh, Jericho Project, Services for the Underserved, and Volunteers of America. Uh, as we continue to work with these partners uh, for veterans uh, who are at risk of losing their housing due to various reasons, DVS will continue to inform, empower, and educate our constituency on the number of services and benefits that they may be eligible for through social media, the DVS newsletter, and other communication platforms. Uh, approximately 6,692 veterans living in New York City are eligible for but do not receive their VA benefits. To alleviate this issue, DVS undertook a proactive approach in creating the agency's VA claims team. First launched on July 5th, the DVS claims team consists of a group of uh, four staff members who assist and file a claim on behalf of eligible veterans seeking an earned benefit such as education, survivorship, or disability. 
As of October 16th, DVS has received 76 inquiries, 37, held, held 37 appointments, and had 10 claims submissions, the vast majority of which involved a claim of disability. Through our outreach efforts, DVS continues to see a significant need for the program. Promoted throughout our social media and weekly newsletter channels, DVS also took the unique opportunity to include this information through our Mission Vet Check initiative. While current claims are awaiting approval from the VA, we anticipate that this program is uh, in, in full swing to return an average $272,222 per month to recipients and their families. These additional funds can assist any eligible veteran, but can also serve as a crucial assistance to financial security during these troubling times. There's no question that COVID-19 has impacted both the health and economic well-being of New Yorkers unlike anything we've seen before. Uh, as DVS continues to develop and implement initiatives to address these impacts, we've leveraged our external partnerships with the private sector to bridge access to crucial resources. Over Memorial Day, the GI Go Fund launched the Empire Vets Job Portal to help connect veterans with jobs during the COVID-19 crisis in industries that are still hiring despite the pandemic. Since launching, the portal has posted over 5,000 positions across all types of industries and engaged over 4,000 new, new, new users. The Empire Vets Job Board will be accessible to the public through the end of the year with the aim of assisting our constituency in finding gainful employment that leverages their military skills through these unprecedented times. We encourage the members of the committee to learn more by visiting uh, empirevets.com. Our outreach team also remains well-versed in a number of other employment resources and through our existing relationships, especially in the new Vet Connect NYC in-house care coordination center model, where DVS is able to connect job-seeking veterans to providers such as Workforce One, America Works, and Institute for Career Development, just to name a few. Uh, earlier this summer, one of our outreach team members even helped a veteran with his resume by providing direct guidance and support when this person needed it the most. This example explain, displays the ongoing commitment of our team that our team has to serving our community, no matter what it takes. As the unemployment situation in New York City continues to evolve, DVS stands ready to help and guide our veterans in need. The health and safety of New York City's veterans is of utmost importance to us, and I'm proud to share that the DVS team has distributed over 35,000 reusable face masks throughout our community, community thanks to a generous donation from the Boomer Naturals uh, Company. Masks were provided to all VA, uh, four VA hospitals, vet centers, veteran nursing homes, supportive housing facilities, veteran homeless shelters, and veteran service organizations. To date, DVS has worked with 58 different organizations to ensure these masks made their way into our community. In addition, we ensured each mask was distributed with printed materials from DVS in the city, promoting VA claim services, food assistance, our newsletter, our oral history initiative or the Veteran Voices Project, and of course, the city's test and trace program. Um, simply put, data drives our operation. Since I've had the honor of assuming the role of commissioner, DVS has undertaken a robust, detailed, and active data collection approach through various efforts. For example, DVS has gathered additional information on New York City's employees who are veterans, those receiving tax benefits through the city, those who have an IDNYC card and those serving as principals and administrators in education. In addition, DVS is in receipt of the return on names and addresses list, which provides DVS with the names and addresses of every veteran who returned from military service to New York City in 2019 and those returning after that quarterly. We anticipate this list to provide 750 to 1,000 names per year. Further, in conjunction with the RONA list, DVS also received all veterans information uh, receiving VA benefits in New York City and the corresponding codes associated with the benefit they are receiving. Uh, we anticipate this list to number in the tens of thousands of names and information. Through our commun communications team, DVS has actively built a robust social media and, news, uh, and newsletter following. DVS has also increased its engagement with our constituency through our, our SITREP podcast, detailing various New York City veterans stories. Since the beginning of the year, our traditional social media platforms, such as Facebook and Twitter, have seen a 20% increase in followers compared to last year. Additionally, our social media post exposure increased exponentially through April, hitting a peak of 199,200 impressions between April and May. 
through these metrics, our agency has been able to reach more veterans and provide greater services than ever before. Uh, through our newsletter, DVS provides COVID and programmatic information every week. These updates include programs and services such as Mission Vet Chat, VA Claims, and the Veterans Voices Project, COVID testing locations, and advocating for our constituents to fill out the census, and, and as always, information on how to best reach our agency. Uh, since the pandemic, DVS has seen an increase in our open rate to 11.4%, uh, approximately 50% increase from last year. And that is the open rate for the communication that we're sending out as far as our newsletter. Uh, these collective efforts have enabled DVS to better understand, track, and communicate with our constituency, whether they are an individual living in Brooklyn or a New York City employee. Uh, as we continue to discover innovative ways to better reach our constituents, we look forward to informing and providing services to more New York City veterans. Uh, in conclusion, as we navigate the challenges presented by the pandemic and beyond, DVS will continue to build out and provide quality services and information to New York City, to New York City's veteran community. Whether it is providing essential services such as housing and benefit navigations, or through new programs and initiatives like Mission Vet Check or VA Claims, uh, I am confident that we will serve as a national model for years to come. A uh, common phrase in the military is, you know, we adapt to overcome. As we move forward through the end of 2020 and into the new year, we will strive to improve with each day to better serve our constituents and the issues they face. We thank you for the opportunity to testify on this matter and look forward to any questions that you or other members of the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else testifying? Do we have a, a second person testifying or the, the other two individuals here for uh, Q&A? Uh, we're here for uh, Q&A. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Um, okay, so I just want to begin by asking questions and then I'll, I'll go to my colleagues. Um, so first, let's talk about the uh, housing. Um, how did the DVS work to locate housing during the pandemic in, in a safe manner? Because uh, what I understand is like during the pandemic, and especially during March and April, uh, people couldn't actually go out to seek housing. Um, and because they needed to shelter in place, uh, may have been in quarantine, could, could have been in isolation. So you mentioned, I think there were 60, um, how many people did you find housing during the pandemic? Oh, you, you're muted? You got it. Okay, sorry, Mr. Chair, continue. I'm sorry, I just wanted to let you know I'm muted. Yeah. Oh, did you hear my question? I, I did. Um, can, I just want to make sure I've got this right. It was, uh, how many folks have we helped as far as finding housing during the pandemic? Is that correct? Yeah, correct. So I just want to um, start by just uh, clearing out that, uh, just to make the fiscal year to fiscal year comparison for now, um, and then to dig down deep, just as mentioned in the testimony, Mr. Chair. So for FY 2020, we've housed 184 uh, veterans. And then during fiscal year 2019, it was 158 just to provide that, that you know, difference as far as we did increase it uh, fiscal year to fiscal year. And then as far as the, uh, during the pandemic, uh, I will, give me a second, let me see if I can get this. Let's, let, me, let me just add these up. I'm counting, for, if we look at from February to um, August, as far as the height of it, I'm just adding this right now, forgive me. All right, so, counting it out from, excuse me, not February to, yep, let's go February to August. Give me a sec. I'm just adding these up right now in real time. Um, it's 65 is a number from February to August, Mr. Chair. So how is, how was that done during the pandemic? Like I mentioned, you know, many people couldn't find housing um, since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, many had to shelter in place. Some were in isolation, some were in quarantine. So it was a very challenging time to find housing. So how was DVS able to do that in a safe manner? Well, for us, it was um, just to name a few different things that we did. You know, we had, you know, regular calls with uh, the Human Resource Administration, their project, their their public engagement unit, 
and other partners to make sure that we can keep getting listings. Um, we also had held virtual viewings, and you know we sent videos and photos uh, of the units, uh, you know, to to our clients to make sure they were able to view. So as far as that act of almost acting as something of a broker for the veterans who are living in housing, we just found ways to continue to push forward on that, uh, Mr. Chair. How was it? That, what kind of housing? Like, it, um, was it supportive housing? Was it um, regular housing? Where a veteran, you know, you're able to find uh, housing in in some some building somewhere in the five boroughs. So how how was it done? My question is, how was it done that, you know, when the veteran um, looks at a, an apartment uh, virtually and then has to go down and move in, was there any type of testing? Um, was there any type of um, way to find, to see if the, anyone in the building was in quarantine or in isolation? So this way the veteran is able to transition into that apartment in a safe manner. Like how, how, was, how did the process work? If you just give me like, you have 65, you found 65 apartments for veterans. So if you just give me like an exam, uh, example of what was done with HRA to get that veteran into housing in a safe manner. So there's, there's what we mentioned as far as the, the remote aspect of it with the outreach and a lot of things transitioning to as opposed to in person being done uh, via telephone, uh, via Zoom. And as far as this other question of, you know, testing the locations to make sure that they were appropriate uh, for those veterans, I can't speak to those private owners of those properties as far as what their standard was. Um, I can say that, you know, as far as brokering that lengthy exchange, a lot of which was virtual, was getting us to these conclusions of being able to continue to house the veterans. And also, as far as the types of housing, we're talking mostly about those who are within the city's shelter system. So those for whom we're looking at transitional, looking at supportive housing, as far as the types that were on the table. You have a breakdown of how many went into supportive housing, how many went into uh, apartments, non-supportive housing. Do you have a breakdown of that? Don't have that right now, Mr. Chair. We're happy to circle back with it, though. But we, we... So you feel confident that whatever housing you found for veterans, that it was done in a safe manner? I mean, Absolutely. Everything... Okay. Yes. Um, now, uh, a report showed that 400,000 people um, left New York. I don't know if you read that report. Um, there was a few months ago. And um, which means there's a lot of vacancies in buildings throughout the city. So how is DVS taking advantage of those vacancies by filling them with veterans? I think for us, it's the, a different way to put this is, um, think of our VPC team as, uh, well, uh, first and foremost, we are continuing our outreach to landlords. And so we've been able to see through that outreach, the you know increased response, I guess, receptiveness to housing the veterans. And so as far as capacity goes, you know, we uh, make sure that landlords are able to you know, sign up to, to list any of their vacancies or let us know if they want vets. And we have someone uh, in our, you know, uh, our housing and supportive services team who simply works to continue to have those touch points. So we know who is, um, you know, what we are offering and to say, hey, look, if you want to have any vets, please, uh, you know, let us reach out to us and we can connect you with the veterans. That's one aspect of this. I think another aspect of it is that our, uh, our you know, our veteran peer counselors uh, who are excellent uh, are just continuing to, you know, one by one work with our veterans to go through these back and forths that result in a veteran successfully moving into a place from the shelter. So it's, you know, it's, it's, we've got the ground game of working with our veterans as far as helping them through that process of applying for housing. And we have the more strategic game where we have someone on staff who is constantly reaching out to owners of properties to say, hey, look, you know, take our people in. How many veterans are currently in, in the homeless shelter? I have to get back to you on the exact number. Um, the, the number I was... Oh, approximately, we're at just under 600 approximately. And that's that's approximately right now. So just under 600 right now, Mr. Chair. Um, how many of the 600 are uh, eligible um, for HUD bash, eligible to go into, um, into regular housing if they're able to, uh, if they don't need the support of housing? I'm going to have to get back to you with the exact number on that as far as how many break out for VASH and how many break out for VASH continuum. Um, so I don't have that exact number on me right now. We'll get, I we can get back. Ask, yeah, I just want to ask uh, Commissioner your, um, you and your team if, uh, if possibly if they could do a, you know, a little more outreach 
um, in regards to finding vacancies, because the numbers of 400,000 people who left New York City and the numbers of uh, uh, homeless veterans at 600. So if you take 600 and 400,000 people that left New York City, I think that we could put a, a, a nice uh, majority of the homeless veterans into, into regular housing. No, so uh, if, if we could, if maybe if we could do just a better job just to do, to, to do outreach and more social media uh, reaching out to people that have vacancies. Um, no, I, I completely agree. We can continue to do that. I just want to be clear too. Our numbers are going down. In other words, we're still continuing to move the needle in the right direction yeah, here. I, I agree with that. But, but, yeah. but, but more can be, I, I won't, um, we're not going to sit down on our laurels. We'll continue to chop the tree and I completely take the feedback as far as the outreach. And uh, we will definitely take that. In. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I want to speak about the, the food uh, security. Um, what are the current number number? What are the what are, what are the current number? Um, what is the number of uh, New York City veterans right now? So right now, the count of as far as our New York City veterans community in total, we're looking at two hundred ten thousand, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, and how many of uh, of those veterans does VBS have contact information for from the two hundred and ten? And I just want to be clear, that's 210,000 as far as the approximate numbers, 210,000. Uh, another one I'll give is an approximate number as far as those we have contact for. I'm saying this is an approximate because still working with our partners and finishing up agreements with some of our fellow city agencies to make sure we can obtain information they have on veterans. So I'd say it's uh, approximately 70,000 for whom we have information for. But once again, ink is still drying on a lot of those agreements. And I'm happy to defer to Cass, who's also on this Associate Commissioner Cass Alvarez, if she wants to add more to that effort. So 70,000 people during the pandemic from beginning of March up until, uh, up until today, you're saying that 70,000 people were reached out to in regards to resources for um, that uh, needed resources during COVID, uh, during, no, during this no, pandemic? I, good question. Very good question. What I'm saying is, we have, so there's, right now we're, we have the approximately 70,000 as far as the contact information of veterans who live in the city. And, you know, that's the, the, the whole of what we've got. But then as far as our outreach, when we talk about, you know, the number of folks who, you know, who are agreeing to subscribe to our newsletter or the folks who we're still calling, we're at 17,000 is how many we've called so far with Mission Vet Check. So we're still <laughs> chopping the tree down there as well. And so, you know, we, we try to reach out to the 210,000 through all means possible, uh, including that 70 in whatever way, but me reaching out versus you affirming that you've heard from me, the two different things, sir. So the 70,000, so you don't have the contact information for the 70,000? You said you only, you reached out to 17,000. Well, yeah, so. What I said is we, so for us right now, we have the contact information for the 70,000. So far, we've been able to reach out to 17,000 of the 70,000. That's because of manpower? Like, how do you reach out to the 17,000, 17,000 out, out of 70,000? It's not a manpower issue. It's, it's uh, this is the different things all happening at once. One of them is us having uh, different agreements with our various city agencies as we're gathering this information for the veterans. So to make sure that we've got as much as we can through what the city currently is collected through a lot of our sister organizations. Uh, another piece of it is, you know, just the making these phone calls as far as one by one uh, as part of our mission vet check program to, to make sure that we're touching with these folks. And it, it's, it's something where we can't just, you know, snap our fingers and have called all 70,000 overnight. Um, so it does take time. How many of the 70,000 does DBS have emails for? I have to get back to you with the exact number as far as the 70,000 that we have emails for. So we've got the contacts to be clear. We have 70,000 contacts. You have, if you have, if you have, you, you mentioned commissioner that you can uh, contact them with a snap of a finger, but if you have, let's say 70,000 emails and they have computers and they have email addresses, then with one click of a button, you could reach the 70,000 people. So that's why I'm curious to know how many uh, do you have phone numbers, contact phone numbers for, and how many do you have emails for? And that's why I'm wondering why the number is 17,000. So we've got, so it's about, we can get, get back on as far as the specifics. I know right now we have of the 70,000, we have 24,000 emails. And I'll just give an example back to the testimony where I mentioned how we've had uh, more folks opening the DVS newsletter, yet 
we have about, you know, that's 11.4% is our opening rate, you know, so sending that email out is just step one, you know, as far as what we can reach, but we are happy to circle back with more granular information. Um, you know, the most important takeaway to me is that we're doing everything we can with all that we have, Mr. Chair, to reach out to our constituents. So through whatever means are available to us. Does DBS, does DBS have access to, to those emails, 24,000 emails? That means in-house you have 24,000 email addresses. Is that, that a is, fact? That is correct. And oh, so there's, another, a, there's a difference between having words, email addresses and folks open it up when you email them. I just want to be very clear, so, but yes. So, so you send out 24,000 emails and then it all depends how many people actually open it up. Yeah. Right. So that's what you're saying. So that's where you got the 17,000. 17,000 is with the phone number program with mission vet check, as far as the number of calls that have gone out so far. So for us, it's, we have such a diverse community, Mr. Chair, that it's really about what's the best way to reach someone. So you've got email where we've got this regular drumbeat of the newsletter going out. You've got the phone calls through mission vet check where each week we're placing more calls directly to those for whom we have phone numbers. You have social media where we're active, uh, you know, online, uh, particularly uh, on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Uh, you have folks call us as well. We still, you know, have the phone calls coming in. And so it's just really by all means that are available to us to try to throw everything but the kitchen sink at the outreach subject. So the 17, let me go back to the email. Is that all in-house? Like when you when you tell when you say that you reached out to twenty four thousand people, or you can't you actually contacted seventeen thousand veterans. Is that done in house, or this is information you may be getting from, you know, non for profits or other agencies who have contacted with the with the with the with the veterans? So basically, what I want to know is is that does DVS have the database of all the veterans, whoever you're telling me you contacted, or do you rely on um, non for profits and others who are supplying you with information. Okay, I contacted 5,000 people, I contacted 2,000, I contacted, you know, is, is this all coming directly from DBS? That's what I want to know. Is everything done in house? Like all the information, the database is within DBS. So for us, it's um, we right now we are working with partner organizations on this. So we do have a good amount of information that's in house but we also have info that we're relying on our partners are. And right now we're building that database um, using multiple sources as far as having one engine for this. But to be clear, there's the vehicles with DVS. Then there is also amplifying things through our partners. And there's what we do with other measures such as social media, such as folks visiting the website and whatnot. But we are building the database, Mr. Chair. Are, are they not allowed, are they not allowed to give DVS the information like personal information, like an email address? It's not, it's that uh, for a lot of it, and uh, I'm, I'll say a little bit more and I'll, I'm gonna you know, bring in Cass or our Associate Commissioner Alvarez on this one. Um, a lot of it is agreement by agreement with organization by organization or discussion by discussion. A uh, perfect example is the RONA list or the return on active names list. That's names that we receive from the VA saying here are people we're tracking who have uh, you left the service, but who now we believe reside in New York City. That was through a discussion with that group. When we look at other organizations that we tie in with IDNYC, that was a discussion followed by an agreement to, to iron out with the IDNYC folks to know which veterans the, who have gotten that veterans identifica identification on their card, um, you know, maybe we have their info. And so I, I can defer to Cass also to, to really speak a little more about this. Yeah, absolutely, Commissioner. Thank you for that. Um, and good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to testify today um, and to address your questions regarding the agency's COVID response. Um, so the Commissioner is exactly right. We've partnered with agencies um, as we developed our Mission Vet Check uh, outreach initiative to acquire their veteran lists, whether that be through constituents that they've served, um, veterans using the IDNYC card, um, and we got those lists through different agreements with those sister agencies. Um, and so that is what helped us build that constituent base that we reached out to through Mission Vet Check. Um, as Commissioner mentioned, we have roughly around 24,000 email addresses. Right now, that information is housed in different places. We're working towards pushing all of that into our CRM and streamlining them into one system. Yeah, so I, that's that's a, that's the only that's what I'm trying to figure out. Like, what does it take so long to get the 24,000 emails in in DVS's system? 
So like, um, why, do you, why do you have to rely on uh, other agencies or other, you know, other sources to give you the information or to, or to do an outreach when DBS could just, you know, one click of a button, you could get all this information out like within minutes. I yeah. want to be very clear about this. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Yeah. It's, it's, if you, just because you email 24,000 people doesn't mean that all 24,000 are going to pick up. And so it's a question of, okay, what else do we, what other means do we have to reaching out to these folks? And I so, so it's, that, it's the that, effort. I, I about that. In other words, what you're saying that already happens. It's just, we, you know, we've got to make sure that if, if someone isn't, so 70% of veterans are 55 or older in the city. If someone is not as quick or savvy on email, how else can we be able to engage them? So I, I just want to- yeah. I, I agree that you, you're, you're not going to get just, you know, if you're sending out 24,000 emails, you're not going to have 24,000 pe 24, people opening up. I just want to make sure that the effort is being done, that you have the entire database in-house within DBS, DBS, and that information should have, should have, you should already have that. Uh, it shouldn't take too long to and, just... And to clear, we, so what we're saying is we've got the 24,000. It's as far as the, when I talk about the large number of 70,000, that's based on these agreements that we've hammered out one by one with our sister entities. And a lot of it goes back to, and I'll defer back to Cass because she's got the, the ball on this, is this issue of consent. In other words, it's, you know, to make sure that, you know, if someone has data for uh, one of their constituents, that they are comfortable knowing that it is being used if they share it with us as a sister agency in a way where, uh, you know, privacy issues are not being violated and where everything is above board and where we're not, you know, it, it does not appear, appear intrusive. So that's a whole other aspect of this too and why it takes time brick by brick to build the what we build to get the data from our sister agencies as we grow our database. All right. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, I just want, I want to get on to uh, continue on the, on the food I'm security. sorry, I got I to gotta throw this in there too. Something that's completely, that is important too is, you know, we have some members of our community who won't even say that I am a veteran, you know, who won't even identify that they are a part of a veteran. And so that makes it even more nuanced here as far as what we're doing and aggregating this info. I, I got that. Okay. Um, also regarding the food security, you mentioned that, um, um, you referred veterans to 311 for the, for the grab and go meals. So we, we have 10 people in staff who are trained in the get food NYC program who can enroll them directly, but you also, you know, have veterans who may call 311 as a resource for it. But as far as get food NYC, that's something where we've got people on staff, we're able to enroll veterans. And that's the one where we have 350 to 400 uh, veterans who are homebound, who have meals delivered to them right now through that program. And then that's separate from the other work that we do to push food out once a week from Brooklyn and once a week from the Bronx. If a veteran called three and one on, on his or her own, would you have that information if they called in saying that I'm a veteran? Would that information go to you? Yes, um, it would. So the folks from 301 will send us a report regularly about this as far as uh, folks who call in on issues where they identify as veterans. And we also include, just so you know, it's um, in Local Law 44 um, submission, uh, as far as our reporting of uh, call center, et cetera, there's a section that does focus on 301 where we do include that information. And so in our Local Law 44 submission, we also have that ironed out as far as what's coming into the 311 call center. And um, I'm sorry, Cass, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Uh, no, Commissioner, I think you, I think you've got that. If the veteran requires um, service from our agency, then we would follow up with them and we would get their contact information so that we can uh, render render that service to them. Uh, what what would you say is different um, between um, a non-veteran calling three hundred one for food for for their get food New York uh, NYC or a veteran calling up? What is what is the difference in services? Like when you're calling 311. I'm sorry, I want to make sure I've got that question. Was it the difference in services so, call 311 for food, Mr. Chair? Is that the question? Yeah. Let's say let's say a veteran calls um, um, 311 uh, for the Get uh, Food NYC program, and a non-veteran calls up. What is the difference in services that 311 would take that information as a veteran and give that information over to you? I want to just clarify one thing too, just while we, we're just to, to get it right. So right now we haven't gotten any uh, 311 referrals specific to food. That's that's one piece. And the other one, this goes back to something I mentioned earlier, where 
you know, it, just 311, knowing whether that person is a veteran or not, if they come say, hey, I need food and they don't identify as a veteran, um, then it is possible they be supported by the city, yet we not know that they are a, a veteran. If someone does call in saying they're a veteran, what happens then? Then we'll know, well, whatever the need is, uh, depending on the need, first off, 301 will track that. Once they know they're a veteran, they already have certain information that they track, and so they'll, they'll know that. Um, but if they say, if they're calling for something that is tied to a larger citywide program, if they call about something like, say, benefits for veterans, then that's something where, of course, that service request ultimately will be funneled to us to triage. If they're calling about something like, uh, let's say it's a, it's a spouse, and they're calling about Get Covered NYC, about the city's, you know, the, the medical, the getting on uh, the Obamacare here through the city, um, we might not, we wouldn't know about that that person be referred to the folks who handle Get Covered NYC. And so it's really, when it's something veteran specific, then we'll see the service request. And anything, once they know that they're a veteran, they track what those needs are. And that breakout is, it's in the same information we provide in the local law 44 uh, submission, which comes out in December, every December. So if someone calls 301, if a veteran calls 301, just calling up to get food, and uh, that person says, I'm a veteran, all I want to do is get food. So that information would not go to you saying that someone, a veteran just called. I can't, yeah, I can't, I can't say we've got 100% visibility in that case. That's correct. I can't say that we'll have 100% uh, visibility on it. So, did you receive any phone calls from 311 saying that a veteran just called up for food? No. No, okay. So, so in other words, it's not being tracked by, by a veteran. By the veteran right. by the veteran identifier veteran status. Okay. So that, that's yeah, that was my question. Yep. Um, now, if if uh, a veteran called up asking for food and you referred them to three hundred one, or maybe you made a phone call to them to three hundred one, uh, I know that at the beginning of um, of the Get Food NYC program, there were many obstacles and challenges for people. Um, maybe because of the dietary restrictions or some something else, did you receive like a second call from veterans saying well, we're having an issue with the food that we're receiving? It's, you know, I, I guess it's, oh, yeah, I, I, we hadn't gotten anything through the 311 channel, especially because as soon as Get Food NYC came on board, we made it a point to have our people trained to be able to deal with these things themselves. And so in an issue where uh, someone is re reaching out to 311, and saying that there are, if they, what you, I'm hearing you say is someone calls 311, they say, I'm a veteran and I'm complaining about Get Food NYC. Will that get back to DVS? And I, it, I can't say that that will. Uh, I know that if we put them in Get Food NYC and they come back to us and say, hey, I have some issues, then we take that right away and, and go back to the 311 team on it. Um, so, yeah. And to be clear, <laughs> we haven't received any 311 related issues, anything on food, 3311, we've not received. Our food workers come through us enrolling people directly and get food NYC through the food that we distribute every week through what's coming out of Brooklyn uh, with the uh, folks from Campaign Against Hunger and through what's coming out of the Bronx. You haven't received any complaints after after notifying 311? We, yeah, we haven't received any complaints on food through 311. To be very clear, so no complaints on food through 311, no requests for food through 311, and, uh, you know, for... Anyone who calls 311 asking about a food connection is typically tied directly to Get Food NYC. But that, how many people actually reached out to uh, um, going through DVS or Vet Connect asking for food? So that's the um, that's the number that gets us to the it's 350 to 400 right now that are still receiving meals that are homebound veterans. I believe the overall count is 462 where we've gotten any certain requests. But uh, so 462 total requests. But we're at a current rate of 350 to 400 who say, okay, I still receive this food from Get Food NYC. And all satisfied. Right on, or, I'm sorry, say it again, Mr. Chairman. Are they all satisfied with the services? I, I believe so, as far as just the numbers are telling me that they're satisfied uh, with the services. And what we, we like is that we also are working to get the fresh food out as far as what's coming out of Brooklyn and what's coming out of the Bronx as well to folks. And so, you know, we're doing everything we can to try to get food in front of our people um, when they say they need it. I'm going to ask a few more questions before I give it over to my colleagues. Um, uh, I just wanted to speak about employment um, for, for a few minutes. How many veterans um, have lost their jobs because of the pandemic? And how many veterans were furloughed um, 
during this pandemic and how did DBS help them navigate to receive any type of uh, employment or I, I, I can't answer, and I'll, I'll start a little bit of this and I'll, I'll get it over to Cass. I can't speak on the veterans who've lost jobs or furloughed. We don't have that data. I know that nationwide, the veteran unemployment rate is 6.4%, but I can't speak in a hyper-local way on New York City as far as how New York City veterans have been impacted at this time on this. Um, what we can say as far as things that we've done on employment, uh, as we've mentioned, not just the Empire Vets platform, but also things that we see with SBS and Workforce One and promoting that to our veterans, promoting the DIFTA's uh, Department for the Aging uh, Senior Employment Program, promoting uh, in, uh, NYC at Work, which is with our mayor's office of people with disabilities. And so we've really done everything we can to try to get the word out to employment opportunities for our veterans, even in these times. Um, yeah. So no one, no one reached out to Vet Connect on um, regarding being unemployed, losing their jobs, anything, I mean. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were asking me a question. I thought you were just asking, what is the New York City unemployment level for veterans? And we tried yeah. to find this, by the way. It's not something that's gathered in the public use micro data and what the census, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics collects or what the census collects. Like we tried a few weeks ago, not a few months ago, so we could know with a T what the veteran unemployment uh, level was in New York City, we couldn't get it. But um, that's separate from the Vet Connect question that you're just asking. Yeah, so what's the answer to the Vet Connect question? How many, how many veterans uh, reached out to, through Vet Connect or to, um, to DBS that they were either furloughed or uh, lost their job? Uh, during I'm going I'm I'm to I'm defer to Cass to that, but I just want to start off by just making clear that when we look at this, it's not just Vet Connect as an intake, it's we're thinking of it in terms of folks who come to us in general between what we've seen on Mission Vet Check, what we see through email, through phone, all of it. But I I'll defer to Cass to, to add okay. more. Thank you. Thank you for that, um, Commissioner. So uh, we know from March through August um, that Vet Connect received 125 service requests regarding employment. So what happens with these requests? Uh, they get referred to providers that are within the um, service provider network. Um, and that includes some of the organizations that the commissioner just mentioned, uh, in addition to uh, Workforce, the Institute for Career Development, et cetera. Um, the care coordinators at VetCheck, I'm sorry, at uh, VetConnect NYC assess that person's uh, need and then make that referral uh, based on the appropriateness of that provider. My next question is how many of that, how many of the 125 were veterans who didn't have employment before the pandemic? Uh, how many were veterans who were furloughed? And how many were veterans who just lost their job because of the pandemic? So we don't have that breakdown prepared for today, um, Chair, but we can get back to you and, and take a look and see if there, if we could find that information. That is granular um, details that we would have to look into. Now I'm gonna ask the big question. You ready for this one? So the big question is, is that since the beginning of the pandemic, since March, um, uh, my office has helped uh, probably well over 6,000 people in all five boroughs and beyond um, for people who couldn't navigate to get un, uh, unemployment. And it was almost impossible to get a hold of the, the uh, Department of Labor or any, any person that filed for unemployment. You could sit on the phone uh, for weeks before even getting someone on the phone. And I was working with the governor's office on that. And I know many of my colleagues also, they were working on um, getting people on, on unemployment because people couldn't get a hold of them. So from these 125 people and plus the 17,000 people you may have email addresses for that you got contact with or the 27 or the 24,000 that you have access to, or maybe even the 70,000 um, that there is some type of contact information for, how many of those people were actually um, checked on to see if they were able to get the pandemic insurance uh, or just to get a hold of unemployment um, to, to have that income. 
so mr chair i want i want to be clear that um the 17,000 phone calls that we're referring to are 17,000 calls that were placed to the veteran community uh, through Mission Vet Check, which is our uh, proactive outreach campaign to place supportive phone calls to veterans throughout NYC. Um, the calls that were placed were done so by volunteers um, and through a partnership with the National Guard. Um, each of those callers has a resource guide um, that provides information about unemployment services, financial assistance, et cetera. Um, we cannot itemize how many folks asked particularly for, um, uh, at the moment right now, uh, we don't have uh, the information before us to itemize those requests. Um, however, we can tell you that, that we know that that information, if based on that person's need was provided using that resource guide. Um, so if the person didn't proactively flag that they had a need for X, Y, Z, um, then that, that conversation happens organically and that volunteer is equipped to meet that person's needs as best they can using that reference. If that veteran has a more complex need, then they get referred to DVS um, and then our folks will respond to them. Also, I just want to add, Mr. Chair, what's so nuanced with this one is, you know, unemployment is a state program run by the state's Department of Labor. And so what we have done is tried to spread the word about some of the programs that Department of Labor has for veterans, uh, you know, specifically as far as, you know, things with the local veterans employment representatives and anything else that, the, uh, that they offer for those who seek counseling once they file for unemployment uh, benefits. But once again, it's so tricky because this is a state program and we're city agency, but we are aware of this issue and we do try to make sure that our veterans know the resources that Department of Labor has specifically for vets. Yeah, honestly, there's no boundaries when it yeah. comes to city, state or, or federal. I mean, if, no, I respect if someone, that. I appreciate yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, you're right. So, you're absolutely right. So, yeah, so I'm just curious to know up until today, like how many people were actually helped with unemployment to navigate through that? Is there any way to, uh, do, you have the, do you have the numbers that you got from not for profits or other agencies of how many veterans needed to navigate to receive the pandemic insurance or unemployment? We, we, we don't have those numbers right now, Mr. Chair. We're happy to try to, to see what we can obtain. That's just not something that we have. And with this being a state program, it's not something that we have been tracking in that active a way, but we don't have that information right now. Um, and I can add to that, Commissioner, that um, unemployment was not within the first top five categories of assistance requests that were made through Mission Vet Check. Um, what were the top five? grab that for you. Uh, so food insecurity, uh, VA claims slash assistance, uh, third was health care and financial assistance, and then questions around unstable housing. And this came through where? This came through Mission Vet Check, sir. And is, that, is that the only uh, source you get the information from? It's one of the outlets that we, we uh, get information from. Of course, we are fielding uh, direct requests for service through our number. So folks are reaching out to the agency directly. Um, in addition to that, um, we are informing people proactively through our newsletter, which has become much more robust since the onset of the pandemic. Uh, our newsletter has gone from a monthly cadence to a weekly cadence, um, and it is rich with resources and information. Uh, we've covered unemployment, we've covered financial assistance, we've covered housing, SSVF. Uh, so we've been really proactive about getting information about these resources out there digitally and through the phone calls that we've been making through Mission Vet Check in case we're not connected to somebody digitally. All right, I'm just, I'm just kind of concerned about the, you know, people who don't have income and now we're seeing like uh, sort of a second wave um, so, and what's happening is, is that in March and April, we were at the, at the peak and then June, July, August, and thereafter, like people who didn't work March and April then may have gone back to work uh, thereafter, but now they may have seen themselves back in the position where they were in March and April. So my question is, is that, I mean, can you do more outreach uh, through, um, uh, um, vet check and, and other providers 
and to actually ask the veterans to see if they need information, if they need help to, to get a hold of the Department of Labor, if they're having any obstacles. Because I understand that it's not a it's not a city, it's not a city program, but we as a city, we should help the people, whether it's it's city or not, to make sure that and you know that they have those resources and we're able to navigate for them to make sure that they they have that income whatever whatever income they could receive if they don't have a job right now yep. and we, we, we know the pandemic insurance was a six hundred dollars um the beginning of march and april and that's a lot of money for a veteran mr chair i think we can we're happy to, to explore what we can do to kind of because i'm completely with you about but I, I, can, I just like i just can't imagine how that could not be one of the top five well, I want to I want to just put this out there. What's tricky is remember it's really seventy one, a little over seventy one percent of our population is fifty five or older in the city, and I don't know if that's something that is kind of baked into this, where we have a larger retiree population, come you know, and if that's a reason why this isn't emerging as a one of the higher needs, you know, it's a different set of needs for this this older group, and uh, that doesn't change the fact that we do need to work on this, and we'll definitely look at it. I agree no, with you. Right. I very much agree, but I just want to say. So much of our population skews older. Um, I think that's what's affecting the numbers here. Got okay, that's a that's a good point. And okay, so we could just um, well work on that. Whatever help you need. So I see. I'm looking at Alika Ampri Samuel. She has. She's not smiling yet, but I think she has a question. Oh, there we go. Does that mean you have a question, Alika? Yes. Go ahead. All right. So uh, let's go in order. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge, I think we have uh, Councilmember Paul Vallone, who joined us. Just a, a brief intermission uh, from the committee council uh, for some ground rules. I will now call on council members in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Uh, council members, please keep your questions to five minutes. The sergeant at arms will keep a timer and I will let you know when your time is up. Ampre Samuel, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Chair Deutsch. Thank you so much, Chair Deutsch. Um, you did an excellent job, <laughs> very thorough. Every time, I, so I had a list of questions here and every time you asked and went into like so much detail, I was like, oh, check that one off, oh, check that one off. So thank you so much um, for your dedication. Um, it's great to see you again, Commissioner, as always. Um, it's, it's really good to see you. And I just wanted to, I guess, clarify a couple of things um, before I get into two questions that was not asked already. Um, in reference to, because you kept mentioning the older population and 70%, over 50, over 55. Um, and I get vet check calls and I understand um, you know, just the entire conversation around how many people you reached out to. But I remember having a conversation with you um, maybe about a month ago, just a check-in. And my concerns were really around how many of those calls actually landed? How many people did you actually speak to like a live person? Um, and that was important to me because during the pandemic, when you look at other agencies that were doing wellness checks, it wasn't about the thousands of calls that were made, it was for me about how many people did you actually reach out to and you had a connection on the other end where there was a live person that said, you know, thank you for calling. This is what's going on with me and this is what I need. And so um, I just wanted to get a sense of how many calls actually landed where there was a live person and you did follow up on that universe of veterans. Thank you for the question. I'm going to defer to um, you know, Associate Commissioner Alvarez on that. She can give the exact numbers. We have that, but I just want to preface it with, you've got the calls that were made, you've got what's answered, and then you've got the number that come back to us as service requests. We don't know the number where, you know, I was able to, as a caller, deal with someone's need right there and it not get to DVS. So that's the one thing. So she'll give you the numbers right now, but it's really, it's the calls that were made. It's okay, you've got what's answered, but then after the answer point, between answered and then there's service requests is what we see. In other words, a caller had a 14 page script of things they can do and say to help somebody, connect the dots right there. And if all else failed, they push it over to our agency. And so for us, what we don't know, but we, we really believe was, was effective was just the aspect of this that was 
just having somebody to talk to. In other words, separate from the service request, just, you know, I'm getting a phone call, I'm in social isolation, and this is another veteran, and we just bonded for a while, and that meant something to me. Or, you know, uh, or I'm a spouse, et cetera. So I'll defer to Cass for the rest, but I just want to- Okay, and, and let me just get my questions out too. And Chit, um, Chit Deutsch, if you can just give me like a couple more minutes to be able to get all the answers um, and, and, and questions. So that was one. Um, and then also with the Get um, Food NYC conversation that I was just listening to, um, you stated, that they were satisfied with the services. It was a question about were they satisfied with the services, right? And so um, for me also, that's a, a different issue because remember our seniors in certain buildings had issues with not just the nutritional part of the food, but also being able to get the food because there was a conversation around the delivery um, services being dropped off at the front of the building or downstairs and having to connect with community folks and volunteers to get that um, food up to or directly to the front door. And so I know that there were some um, uh, conversations that you have had or your the organization, your agency with volunteers to be able to fill in gaps and, and cracks where they were to make sure that the 350 or so that did receive actually received it at the door. And I wanted you to be able to talk a little bit about those partnerships in a meaningful way because what you were talking about was a lot of numbers um, and it was, it's really more about the partnerships that you've made with community-based organizations to be able to really service, um, the veterans and not just what we've been experiencing with the, you know, Uber drivers dropping off the boxes the way they were before. Um, and the last question that I had was just related to the CUNY students. Mm -hmm. Um, let me... Bear with me, oh, mm -hmm. two more. One is the CUNY students. With CUNY and many of the post-secondary institutions moving to forms of virtual and online learning, um, has DVS observed any special needs in the student veteran population? So can you speak to that? And the last one, if you can just, you know, highlight any kind of work that you're doing with re-entry um, and veterans, because we do have veterans that have been incarcerated oh, and are returning home. And so it would be helpful to know if you are preparing or doing anything at all related to re-entry as the city is preparing to do some work around it, including an upcoming hearing. So um, those are my questions. Let me, Thank so, you so no, much. I, I appreciate it so much, uh, council member. So I'm gonna, Cass is gonna tackle the CUNY one. She's gonna tackle the get, uh, the get food uh, as far as that, that piece and satis not just get food, but satisfaction and whatnot. I'll speak a little bit to that. I'm sorry, Cass, I'm sorry. She's gonna tackle vet check, forgive me. She's gonna tackle vet check and she's gonna tackle CUNY and I'll tackle get food, I'll tackle re-entry. Um, the first off with re-entry, we're right now we're just starting to get our hands on this issue of what do we do with the 1500 New York City veterans who are in the state correctional system. And so right now we're still having those discussions on making sure that when uh, any of those veterans return to New York City, we assume that the 1500 or so are from New York City, the majority of them are as we believe that we can be able to have receive them with open arms. And that's something that's still in progress right now, as far as just connecting between the Department of Connections, where we've had our, our corrections, where we've had our initial discussions and tying in with our DVS aftercare and eviction prevention services, that, that team. And so right now that's in its infancy, but that's something that I believe we'll be able to give more information on as we get, you know, uh, you know, when we have a further meeting or next time we check in in general, just circle back with you on it. That's very okay. near and dear to our hearts. You've got about 1500 who are in the correction system at the state level, you got approximately 25 in the wing uh, uh, that in the wing that is reserved for veterans uh, over in Rikers at the city level who are detainees. And so for us, it's making sure that we can connect those dots. I wanna acknowledge you with that. And thank you for bringing it up the last time we spoke too. So just know that that's moving forward. Uh, as far as the get food, uh, NYC with get food what we've been doing because we've got there there are 41 people in DVS right now 38 are actually here because three are deployed three are currently deployed um, of the 38 of us 10 people have been trained with how to get folks on the program so when anyone of our constituents has a problem with it they can communicate with any of those 10 and they can reach out to get food NYC coordinators and on top of that we've been pushing fresh food out uh, each week from Brooklyn, from uh, the Campaign Against Hunger site, which is just in Canarsie, just south of Brownsville, like right, not, not far from the hospital over there. And we've been pushing out 
the, I said 2000 bags, one of those bags has enough food to keep someone sustained for as many as three days. And so we've been pushing out and that's fresh food. That's, you get the protein, you get the starch, you get the vegetables, everything is right there. It's cold and you get directions so you can heat it up, et cetera. And, and so we've been doing that. And with the, what's going on in, in the Bronx on Saturdays, that's the USDA's uh, Farmers to Families Food Box Program. And so you get a box with a gallon of milk, with a dozen eggs, with uh, some frozen chicken, with some yogurt, with some vegetables, et cetera. So you get, and this is like stuff that is very good and qu high quality, fresh food that's going out. And so we've got this mixed bag between our veterans who are using Get Food NYC. If they have any issues, they're letting us know those issues and we're relaying it directly to Get Food NYC. Uh, at the same time, we will go to a VSO in a heartbeat and say, hey, can you please make sure that this person uh, gets some of this food that we're kicking out on Wednesdays? on Saturdays. And just to name a few of the organizations that are receiving the food and distributing it as far as our fresh food. Uh, we're talking about in, let me, let me start in Brooklyn, uh, Black Veterans of Social Justice, as far as getting food out to 10 sites in Brooklyn and beyond for them. The Brooklyn Veteran Hospital. Uh, we're talking about Veterans are Still Warriors, the American Legion's Dory Miller Post 213, the Military Spouses Association and Surf Avenue Vets, and that's just Brooklyn. We look at Queens, we're looking at the Veterans of Foreign Wars post 5298, Veterans Rebuilding Life, Veterans Inc. Food Pantry, American Legion post 483. When we look at Staten Island, it's the community health action of Staten Island. So between that group and what is going out through Black Veterans of Social Justice, we're getting to Richmond County. When we talk about overall New York City, Harlem Vet Center, Housing Plus NYC, uh, Service for the Underserved, the National Association of Black Military Women, Harlem United, Genesis Veteran Supportive Housing, Sage Vets, Samaritan Village. And I'm from the Bronx, so I have to talk about the Bronx. We're talking about the James J. Peters VA Hospital, Bronx Vet Center, American Legion's County Board for Bronx, the American Legion Sam Young Post 620, Jericho Project and Volunteers of America. So we're getting it out to people any way that we can. So if you're a veteran and we're serving you one way or another through Get Food NYC or literally for some fresh chicken and eggs and milk, we're going to get something to you. I hope that did that cover that piece and I can pass the rest no, of the No, absolutely, absolutely. I just wanted to make sure that we highlighted the fact that, you know, you were di directly connected with community-based organizations and groups mm -hmm. and volunteer organizations that was, you know, doing a lot of, of, you know, service directly to, you know, families and veterans. And I just wanted to make sure that that was highlighted because it's helpful in knowing even as council members who we are supporting and, you know, continuing to, help allocate um, funding to the fill these gaps. So thank you so much. No, we appreciate that. I, I got to pass the cast, but it was ironic too. I just have to call out, you know, a lot of these organizations were at the partner convening back in February that you attended, just so you know how these things come full circle. And this is all one team, one fight. It didn't just hit us on the DVS side. It's what you do. It's what the chair does. It's what the other council members do. And we're all trying to attack this and throw everything but the kitchen sink at it. So we appreciate you. Now I'm going to defer to Cass. She will speak to your questions about uh, mission vet check and the percentage of responses. She'll speak to that question you had about these CUNY student veterans. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner. Um, so as we've mentioned, uh, Council Member, we've made over 17,000 calls uh, through mission vet check. About 19% of those calls have been answered. Um, 19 uh, Of those 19 percentage answered calls, 18% uh, of them had service requests that came back to DVS and were fielded directly by our, uh, our constituent services team. Um, during the pandemic, we were able to resolve about 95% of those needs requests, which we're very proud of. 95% um, of the 19%, right? Correct, of the 18%. Of the 18%. Yes, exactly. Um, I want to speak to uh, the value of the resource guide we've put together for those volunteers who are making those phone calls, uh, in addition to the training that those volunteers have undergone. So um, as the veteran client is engaged by the volunteer on the phone, um, we've equipped our volunteers to provide information in real time. Uh, and to provide resources uh, around financial assistance, around COVID testing, um, around housing, et cetera. Um, so we are very proud of the fact that our volunteers are sort of this first line of defense and they're able to answer those questions in real time. Um, and if that person again has more of a complex need, that's when it's sent back to our team for triage and response um, and a referral to another service provider and additional care. 
Um, does that answer your, your questions, council member? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on to, to your um, question regarding uh, the CUNY students. Um, so, you know, we actually held our veterans on campus uh, virtual meeting back on October 7th. Um, we were able to engage with about 16 different schools at that meeting. Um, I'm very proud to say that the schools that have the largest student veteran populations do have a very close relationship with our office, and that includes John Jay, BMCC, Fordham University. Um, we are very close with the uh, CUNY Office of Veterans Affairs as well. Um, of course, there was some concern around BAH um, and uh, uh, the policies surrounding the GI Bill benefits, which have been preserved. They will not be reduced. Um, and that is obviously a federal benefit uh, that Congress was working on. Um, and so there was a little concern about that. You might want to which... wanna say what BAH is. Oh, yes. It's basic allowance for housing. I wasn't sure. Um, if, no, no. You if Deutsch knows. <laughs> Thanks for checking me on that one. We you don't know all the lingo. <laughs> yes, we, we speak in acronyms frequently here. Um, so, you know, we, we supported uh, Student Veterans of America uh, in their work in DC to ensure that those levels remained uh, uh, untouched and unreduced uh, during the duration of the next school year. So that's gonna be in place through December, 2021. I think the biggest thing right now that we're seeing is this need for social interaction. It's very difficult for freshmen right now to be starting uh, school in this type of an environment. Um, and we know that community is very important for veterans, especially those who've just recently transitioned from the service. Um, and so we have uh, decided to come up with different ways to engage the community, one being um, this Veteran Voices Project oral history initiative that the commissioner mentioned that we just recently launched. Uh, we did two live forums uh, with post 9-11 veterans who have been able to talk about their experiences and service. Um, and so that's just one way that we're trying to engage more digitally. I think as the months go on uh, and as we continue to have these conversations with um, our partners at the schools, uh, they'll use our office as a conduit to foster that sense of community and connectivity uh, amongst the student veterans. So we're looking forward to creating more um, opportunities for us to do that and for them to feel that connectedness during this very challenging time. But well, thank you so much, everyone, and thank you for your service. And um, Chair, thank you for the extra time allotted. Thank you. You need another 10 minutes, Salika? Okay. <laughs> Oh, good. <laughs> Anybody else has any other? Well, we have one more hand chair. Uh, next, we'll hear from Council Member Vallon. Starting time. Thank you, Chair Deutsch. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, and Alika, I always love your questions, so you can have my extra time if you need it. Uh, Commissioner, I just wanted to follow up on Chair Deutsch's questioning at the beginning. Um, I guess we've been on this committee now almost seven years, and I was just heartened to hear that we're about 15% of contact information for emails, and that's just not a good number. So whatever the exact number is, it doesn't really matter because we don't have that number, but we know it's, it's not the 200,000 plus, and it's somewhere around 15 to 20,000. So Math is in my major, but that's somewhere less than 20%. How do we fix that? And how do we do that as quickly as possible? Because in today's information age, whether it's social media, and I get we're talking about generational issues with the different ages of our veterans committee. Um, so some may or may not be as accessible with emails but we need to get to a place where we're not at 15%. So what is your vision or plan to quickly get us contact information, whether it's through third party or additional uh, veterans benefits associations that can do that, but we need to get that number up. So how do you think we can do that? I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna let Cass take a lot of this answer, but I wanna you know, just uh, call out, I, I completely agree with where you're coming from, you know, uh, Council Member Vallone. It's funny, when I first joined the Veterans Advisory Board, I was asking the same question you asked just now about you know, where's the data? You know, what are we doing to get a hold of people? And now in this position, I can tell you, uh, the number one thing that we wanted to do as commissioner, get a VA claims unit off the ground, 
Uh, the number two thing is something we call population ID, which is find a way to get as much information about the 210,000 as we are able to. And, uh, you know, Cass will speak to it a little more, but to me, I look at it as these partnerships with our sister agencies. In other words, if someone else is coming in and saying, I'm a veteran to another organization that's affiliated with the city of New York, I want us to know about it. If someone is coming to as an employee with the city of New York and they're a veteran, I want us to know about it and have that info. So it's really those partnerships is one way. Another way is to leverage this. Commissioner, is there a way to link? I remember you had mentioned when a 311 call comes in for service for a veteran. You had said that you're not getting that information simultaneously with your agency to get that contact. Can't we make that a mandatory requirement that, and, and Chair Deutsch and I have been saying this on other committees too, it's not just with veterans, that that sharing of critical information from one agency, that interagency cooperation, that we shouldn't have to reinvent a file or the wheel for when someone calls New York City for assistance, that once someone does, whether they're a senior, whether they're a veteran, whether they're looking for housing or for anything that they're coming to the city for, that information should then be sent to you so that you have that person, that veteran, whether they're looking for housing or food, whether they're temporarily homeless, so that that database is being built for you through much larger agencies as 311 is taking that information so that it eventually gets vetted to you. And I think from what I'm understanding, that's still not happening. Is, is that something that we can assist you with? We had to do that for aging through legislation. I had to do that the same exact thing. And I, I got the same answers that we're trying, we're trying, and finally we passed a bill that says, well, now no more trying, you have to do it. And it forced, it forced the other agencies that work with you to give you that critical data. Is that something we can do to assist you in this? Because it seems like there's data that's being missed at the entry point level that, can, that could quickly give you a leg up on, on that information. So I, um, I think for us, it's, you know, right now, and then just to clarify the 301 point, I take, I trust me, I'll say, I take you what you were saying, when it's something that deals with the veteran identity, in other words, if it's, a, if someone calls 301 and they ask about VA benefits, or if they ask about the healthcare information for veterans, if they ask about legal assistance for veterans, if they ask about uh, Vet Connect specifically, you know, someone calls and just asks that of 311, if they call about uh, employment assistance for veterans, et cetera. When it comes and it is dealing directly with the veteran identity, we do receive that information. Uh, if someone comes for calls for something that's not associated with that identity, then we do not receive that information and I cannot confirm that it is gained. So just to be clear about, about that as far as the data piece. And, and right now for us, what we do is we just, you know, agency by agency, we hammer out these agreements to make sure that privacy is accounted for, for that, that constituent who is a veteran that we might receive the information. Um, so, yeah. Well, that but might I, be a way that, you casting on this. I'm sorry. Yeah, that might be a way then that we can address that. And that, that data. So getting even something as simple as somebody's email address might be something that's newly required now, no matter how they're coming through the portal, because uh, you're not alone in that, that this is not your agency's sole issue. This is across the board. It's taken us quite some time. So you would think this is something that's happening and it's, 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 we're finding it's it's slowly happening with the portals being created, but it needs to happen. And especially when we're going through a crisis like we're going through now, we don't have the luxury of, of time to figure it out. So I'm just offering whatever we can do to propel you to get that missing. It's good to hear that you're getting most of that, but for some of those few instances that you're not, that let's get that to you so you have that overall database and we can easily put between the council members that are on now and chair and Alika Samuel, we can easily get a piece of legislation through to make sure that sister agencies get you that information and then how we can source it out. And that would be my last. I, I just, I just want to, I appreciate you so much for saying these things. I just want to put out there, you know, anyone who asks me, I'll tell them the one of the greatest challenges of this job, the white whale of this job to me is this veteran identification piece. In other words, let's fast forward and say we live in a land, we have this legislation, everything's on the, uh, is, is set. To set. There, there's still a good number of veterans who don't identify and raise their hand and say that they've served. And that's a larger, deeper issue that we're trying to work on. And a lot of that is just to fix that. It's to be in front of people. It's to be present. It's to speak directly to them. It, it requires old school brass knuckle leadership. And, and I, you know, because what happens is 
how can I help you if you won't even let me know that you were a part of the service? We have some veterans, the continuum is everything from, I, you know, I'm too proud to, to admit, not too proud, but I'm too humble to admit that I've served. I don't want any special treatment, not for me. I don't want anyone to look at me any differently because I've served. You know, my grandfathers both served in the Navy, in the Army. Neither of them would talk about it because they didn't want anyone to, they just didn't want to, they didn't want any additional attention. So that's one end of it when someone won't identify. And then the well, other you know end- what, Given Commissioner, what I'll do is it, it's certainly not any reflection of what you've done or not done. It's just, we're on the same page. So you've got council members here and I am, and in the last few weeks with DVS, it's been difficult to get information. So let's use this time. You know, we've got the holidays upon us. There's going to be more demand as we come into these colder months dealing with COVID. Uh, and as we come out, the hardest challenge we had as elected officials when the crisis began was getting information to and from the folks that needed it. So we need that, that communication portal continue to be open with the chair and us to work on these things so that we, listen, we don't wanna to have to do legislation if we don't have to, but it's sometimes it's the only way to get some folks on the other side to, to, to listen up. So thank you chair for the time. And I know you've got a busy schedule, but that's where I would like to see this so that we can leave this when we're done with our term together in a place where that type of portal information is, is readily accessible. Thank you, chair. Thank you very much. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, um, Councilmember Vallone, for your questions, and uh, and I want to thank the uh, the commission. I know that you we just spoke about um, for those who don't identify themselves as a veteran, so you don't know who they are. But we are still dealing with the people who who identify themselves as a veteran. <laughs> so let's get through that hurdle first. <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask um, I want to ask you um, now. Beginning, beginning uh, at the beginning of the peak of the pandemic, has DVS tra um, tracked um, veterans who contracted COVID and, uh, and were there any deaths in the veteran community? Oh, I, oh, excuse me, uh, Mr. Chair, we have not tracked the exact, this almost goes back to the same discussion we just had with Council Member Malone of knowing who is who in the community, but uh, we have not tracked that specific information. Um, so I'm sorry, we, we have not tracked that. I would almost defer to our colleagues at the Department of Health and, and Mental Hygiene on that type of information. So, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, do, do you communicate with the VA hospitals? We have, checked you... our, we have checked with our friends at the VA, and I know that the VA <laughs> has information that's publicly available on uh, things involving like COVID as it pertains to the various hospitals, but that's uh, that's separate from only 30% of veterans use VA healthcare, for instance. And so this goes back to that other issue of identifying our veterans. So we, we, we don't personally directly track the uh, COVID data specific to New York City veterans. It's concerning because, you know, a veteran uh, who may have PTSD has a lot more challenges than others. So if you have a veteran that goes into a hospital and then comes back out, and they are terrified and they have PTSD and they're more terrified and, you know, they have more challenges than others. Like, how, how do we not track uh, those veterans who, uh, first of all, going through the pandemic, right? Um, they would need some type of, you know, uh, resources, mental health resources available to them. And especially if someone ends up in the hospital and comes out, right? It's, it's, it's kind of, uh, traumatic for them to be in the hospital. So how does DVS not communicate with the veteran, with the, with the VA to find out? I mean, it's, it's a simple, we're not talking about um, someone who does identify themselves as a veteran, but I believe that probably most veterans end up in the VA if, if, they, uh, if they contracted COVID. So how does DVS not communicate with the VA to find out who may need those additional services. This, I feel like this keeps touching this other issue of, of personal information because that's someone's personal health information. And so while we know that the VA has its numbers available as far as online, you can be able to see what the, the, the COVID situation is with the different VA hospitals. Um, to the extent of a VA hospital saying, hey, city of New York, 
here is the contact information, information of all of these veterans we've treated who have COVID. I, it's just, it's just a, it, because of privacy concerns and that's health, that's someone's health uh, information as well. There are just several barriers for us there. And to be very clear, only 30% of veterans, and this is a national statistic, roughly 30% of veterans use VA healthcare. So this doesn't fully capture everything either. So it's just, it's, um, I think for us, a lot of it is our mental health related service providers on the Vet Connect NYC platform that we look at when we think about people who are dealing with PTSD or have certain uh, issues where they need to talk to someone. And, and just, to, just to name a few of those providers, we have several. You've got the Headstrong Project. You have the Columbia Veterans Research Center. You have the Stephen A. Cohen Military Family Clinic at NYU. You have the Will Cornell Medical College's program for anxiety and traumatic stress. Um, you have the David Lynch Foundation, the Sierra Club Military Outdoors Foundation. There's just so many groups that when something comes on our radar, we have a deep bench of partners whom we can send those veterans to. It's just um, it's just so hard for us to know all things at all times on this subject, but we're trying, Mr. Chair. And all this, um, uh, what are the numbers on how many veterans received uh, these resources, the mental health resources from these uh, organizations and not-for-profits you just mentioned? I, I'm going to defer to uh, Associate Commissioner Alvarez on that. And I just want to point out that in the Local Law 44 submission, we do provide this information. I know Cass will give you what we've got as best we have now, but know that when the next submission drops, which will be December of this year, that will be publicly available as far as our most recent and updated info about around mental health and support we've done in that vein. But I'll, I'll defer to Cass. Yeah, thank you so much, Commissioner. Um, so we do not have a breakout of mental health requests uh, right now, but we can circle back with that information. Uh, what I will highlight, though, is the um, the quality of the phone calls that are being placed through Mission Vet Check. I've mentioned before that these are supportive phone calls. Um, so there is a mental health aspect to this work in many ways. Uh, we are reducing social isolation uh, by proactively engaging with members of the veteran community. Um, again, I also mentioned that um, uh, we have a robust resource guide that includes crisis resources, that includes information about Get Well NYC. Um, so uh, we, we've got, we've, we have sort of this holistic 360 approach, um, uh, of course, to our outreach as well. Um, we are processing benefits claims, for example. These are all um, services that uh, do contribute to one's mental health and well being. Um, and so I just want to highlight the fact that um, the, our 360 approach really does help uh, in many ways alleviate some of the stressors that do um, impact one's mental health. So we can get back to you with breakdowns, Chair, uh, but I do want to also point back to the fact that we take a very uh, 360 approach to care and to outreach when we're working with this community. Thank you. And all that is done uh, virtual, right? The mental health resources, everything is virtual. So everything you come is across, I'm sorry? Yes, correct. Everything is virtual, sir. Do you come across any veterans who don't have a computer that need access to get online? Um, I can't speak specifically to any cases that I'm aware of, um, but that was part of the reason why we launched Mission Vet Check. Uh, we know that not everyone accesses information the same way. Not everybody is on Instagram. Not everybody is on uh, an email list. Uh, so that's why we also decided to proactively engage through phone calls. Um, almost everybody, uh, regardless of your age, at least has access to a phone, whether it be a landline or a cell phone. And so that's why we decided to take that approach. We, again, upped our um, our digital communications during this time, we increased our newsletter, and then to complement that, we're also placing these phone calls. And, and Mr. Chair, I just wanna add, when we think of telehealth, it's not just the idea of it being done through Zoom or WebEx or some sort of platform like that. It's also something that can be done telephonically. So when I mentioned those providers or those partners, all of those are open to telephonic treatment if that internet um, type of, of service is not available. So someone can have somebody to talk to if need be. Um, Finally, I just want to ask you one other thing about the GI Go Fund. Um, what is that they they do the unemployment, right? They find jobs. What is their purpose, the GI Go? Um, 
I'll start and I'll pass it over to Cass. Uh, so GI GoFund is one of our Vet Connect, you know, uh, partners. They're one of the 80 plus service providers we have on Vet Connect. And, you know, uh, employment support is one of several different offerings that they have. So just to, to list that out. Uh, but yeah, I can defer to Cass to add further. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Um, so the Commissioner has referenced Empire Vets previously. Uh, Empire Vets is an initiative of the GI Go Fund. Uh, the GI Go Fund is a vetted service provider in the Vet Connect NYC network. Um, and so the Empire Vets job board that was developed uh, in response to uh, the unemployment uh, impacts of COVID-19 uh, is really meant to connect veteran job seekers with um, jobs and in industries that are still hiring um, and also to expose them to employers that are veteran friendly. Um, all of the job postings on that site come from employers that are very interested in bringing veteran talent into their companies. Uh, so that's really important for veterans to become educated on because that can help them navigate their job seeking process. Um, we know that over 5,000 jobs have been posted to the site to date. Uh, it's engaged around 4,000 unique users as well. Um, the GI Go Fund is a full service organization, so they offer VA benefits claims processing, um, financial assistance to veterans, et cetera. Um, so they are a full service organization, but one component of their work and their specialty um, is leveraging uh, Empire Vets uh, to connect vets to jobs during this time. Are they, are they city funded? They're not a city funded organization, no. They're a private nonprofit organization. Where are they based out of? They're based out of New Jersey. And one thing I also want to point out, Mr. Chair, is that um, the state of New Jersey also mimicked what uh, happened in New York with the launch of the Empire Vets website. New Jersey launched Garden State Vets. Um, to respond to uh, the un unemployment crisis over in that state as well. So the state worked with uh, uh, the GI Go Fund to launch that site. I'm so sorry, I didn't hear you, it cut out. Um, so when do you refer someone to the GO, um, uh, when, do you, when do you refer someone to the GI Go Fund um, opposed to the Workforce One when it comes to unemployment, which is a city funded agency uh, organization. So uh, the outreach around Empire Vets is done so um, digitally, mostly. We proactively push it in our newsletter, um, um, on our social media. Um, I think it depends on the veterans need to be honest with you. Um, it depends on on um, what that person is looking for, the level of service that they require. Uh, and I'm happy to share that our team is talented enough to make that assessment. Um, in addition to Vet Connect NYC, which, does, which did the same during the pandemic. Um, so, you know, if the shoe fits, then we will make that, that referral accordingly. And again, Empire Vets is a digital resource that we've been pushing out. Mm -hmm. I just want to I just add to that too. When you look at some of the different platforms, you know, Workforce One is a type of program where we refer to a, vet, a veteran who needs ex just overall preparation for the job search and have additional counseling as they get their resume right, as they get their interview skills together, et cetera. And so you can see how Workforce One would fit for someone. Uh, when you look at the Department of the Aging Senior uh, Employment Services Program, that's a program for a veteran who is 55 or older, who lives in the city and who's of a certain income level who is looking to get into the workforce. And it's great for helping that veteran um, transition into a 21st century job or something where they can be able to have that opportunity being an older citizen in the city. Um, when you look at the NYC at Work program for the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities, uh, MOPD has identified employers who are very, very much friendly to hiring members from the disabled community. And so they explicitly post jobs where they're saying, look, this is for people who are have disabilities. And so we make sure that folks know about that platform. And I mean, you know, each of the different, you know, uh, organizations that we refer folks to, and it's really, um, we let people know about all of it. You know, when you look at our website and the COVID-19 resource page, you see all of these uh, and other programs available there. And so for us, it's just letting you know, hey, look, here's what's out here in the ecosystem please do what you can to take advantage of it to be able to get back to having income and being able to eat. 
And you all, I mean, they're all phenomenal organizations, right? I mean, they're all like do great work. Yep, that's correct. Yep. Um, okay. How many jobs? Um, how many jobs were actually found for veterans uh, since since March? This is what's, and I'll start, and I know Cass can finish it. What's difficult with this is to track. You know, did me sending you to the DIFTA, you know, senior employment services, you know, uh, program, did that result in you obtaining? Employment? Are you going to let me know if it did? Or, you know, better yet, same thing for the MOPD, the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities. Did me letting you know about this opportunity through, you know, look at the or jobs board, did that result in you being employed there? This is a nuanced topic in general to kind of connect the dots with how many people did I help get employment out of those who might advertised. And so that's something where it's very nuanced, us getting the data there. We're trying to get a handle on these things, but it's just it's hard for me to say because you read something on our website and went to the, you know, to this other platform and you got a job that I can then credit that through our outreach. And so that's just something we keep running into as far as, you know, the follow up on the job, uh, on that, on the job hirings. Oh, that, that's correct. Not, not only we don't have the numbers, but many organizations don't have the numbers is what I'm saying. Like many orgs. So we don't know. We, so we don't know how successful they are. Or you know, this is, and, this, this, and this is something we can say across the board for, you know, as far as it, it's difficult to say, if I put a job up from another company and someone takes advantage and gets that job, it's hard for me to know whether I can be attributed to that. That I don't know if it's my influence that led to that happening or if that's going to be credited to me. And this is not just a city of New York DVS thing. This is a problem in the workforce, a challenge in the workforce development space in general to be able to identify efficacy or confirming that, you know, you doing X led to Y as a result. So, I mean, the truth is you have, I mean, you said you have 210,000 veterans here in New York City, but, but you don't have information on all the 210,000. So how difficult would it be to track um, the veteran, the information you have in those veterans to see who actually got a job from one of these providers, that shouldn't be too difficult. So if I just wanna throw that out. Um, all right, I just wanna ask the commissioner, thank you very much. I wanna ask you if you could uh, give a message um, to the people watching, to veterans and family of veterans uh, during these trying times. And uh, I know how difficult it is, how you were saying that uh, many veterans who are not identifying themselves uh, to DVS, you want to encourage them also to identify themselves as a veteran so this way they could take advantage of some of the services that are available. So um, I just want to ask the people who are watching, um, people listening, that if you know a veteran and uh, make sure that they are part of the veteran community and they're also part of Vet Connect. So I want to ask you, Commissioner, if you could give a message during, during this time and we're still facing this pandemic uh, here in the city and across the country. Um, so the floor is yours. I, well, first off, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair, for just you know having us come and appear and, and testify today and, and being here. And before addressing everyone else, I want to just call out you and the other uh, council members who we couldn't do what we do in the way that we do it, but for your support. And we appreciate you for everything. I just want to be very clear about that. Uh, and out to, to all in the veteran community who may be watching this right now, I guess three things I'd, I'd leave with you, you know, one is when in doubt, reach out, you know, it could be reaching out to us. And of course, we can be reached at nyc.gov slash vets online. We can be emailed at connect at veterans.nyc.gov. You know, you can find us on social media. It's at NYC veterans, you know, so when in doubt, reach out. It could be reaching out to the chair who has been brilliant in this effort uh, through his team or any of the council members. It could be reaching out to your local veteran service organization to just say, hey, you know, I, what can I do to be able to help others or to be able to help myself? But just, you know, nothing happens if there is not action. And so I would just advise all who can hear this to do what you can to just put one foot in front of the other, if not just to help yourself, then to help other members of the community. Because that brings me to the second point I would make, which is that, and I tell this over and over and over again, service did not end when you took the uniform off. And we are in a crisis right now as a city. We just spent 
almost two hours talking about all the things going on and everything that everyone's trying to do to get a handle on this so we can continue to help our veterans and their caregivers, survivors, and families. So anyone who has it in their power to give something, anything that you've got between your time, your talent, your resources, whatever you can do, please get in the fight with us because we're not gonna be able to do this by ourselves. We need to work together, everyone from across all ends of the spectrum. And then I guess the, the last thing I'd say is, you know, continue to stay strong. You know, these are very tough times, but we as a community have been through tough times since our existence. What defines us as veterans, not just veterans, but those who support veterans, is this willingness to put everything else above ourselves, even when it's extremely hard, even when everything is on the line. And that's what we're in right now. And so I just ask all who are observing this, be it veterans, be it family members, caregivers, survivors, you name it, just continue to endure. We have not, no one would win money if they bet against us because they, you know, that, that bet will always be lost. And so, you know, it's so important for us to just continue to keep calm and carry on even in the middle of this pandemic. So, um, you know, once again, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. We appreciate you, appreciate uh, all the other council members too. And, um, you know, uh, just turning it back over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you for those words and thank you to your team and to my colleagues. And I just want to end by saying, uh, God bless the United States of America. God bless our military. God bless our veterans and God bless you all. Thank you very much, Commissioner. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Uh, we'll now turn to public testimony. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one. Panelists will have three minutes to testify. Council members who have questions for panelists uh, should use the raise hand function in Zoom. And I will call on you and the panelists have, when the panelist has completed the testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, uh, a, a member of the staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you uh, the go ahead to begin testimony. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you can begin before delivering your testimony. Our first panel will consist of Allison Messine, Ashton Stewart, Ryan Foley, and Peter Kepner. Please bear with it, there's a, a bit of a delay. Can everyone hear me okay? We can hear you. Great. Starting time. Good afternoon, Chair Deitch and fellow city council members. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify today. My name is Allison Messina and I'm the Vice President for Workforce Development at Project Renewal, a New York City homeless services nonprofit agency. For more than 53 years, Project Renewal has empowered individuals and families who are experiencing homelessness to renew their lives. Each year, Project Renewal serves nearly 15,000 New Yorkers, including hundreds of veterans through our wraparound services focused on health, homes, and jobs. We are grateful to Speaker Johnson, Chair Deitch, and the City Council for the generous support of Project Renewal's Homeless Prevention Services for Veterans, support that has been crucial for us to help our veterans across all of our programs. We especially thank the City Council for its continued support during the COVID-19 pandemic in the face of such serious fiscal issues and across the board funding cuts. Since the beginning of our fiscal year in July, we have served 60 veterans in our housing programs and veterans in our vocational programs and 86 veterans in our healthcare programs. This year, our staff has met the unprecedented challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic with unyielding courage, compassion, and professionalism, keeping veterans and other vulnerable New Yorkers safe, healthy, housed, fed, and employed. When the pandemic began, we immediately implemented new safety and sanitation protocols in our shelters and housing programs, and we launched on-site COVID testing with support from our mobile medical team. To facilitate social distancing at the city's direction, we followed health experts guidance by relocating more than 800 of our shelter clients to four hotels identified by the city. 
There, we have continued providing clients with a wide range of support services they've been receiving at our shelters. As a result, fewer than 5% of our more than 2,000 shelter clients and housing program residents have tested positive for COVID. For, furthermore, at the height of the pandemic, our mobile and shelter-based medical programs were on the front lines providing quality care while easing the burden on our city's overwhelmed emergency rooms. We also expanded our telehealth programs from three providers to 16 to provide uninterrupted medical, mental health, substance use disorder care remotely for more than 1,100 clients. We have not paused our workforce development programs during the pandemic either. Since mid-March, we have placed 210 of our clients into essential jobs. These placements in food delivery, package handling, security, maintenance, they've helped keep the city functioning and enabled our clients to progress towards economic stability. Um, meanwhile, our social purpose catering company, City Beat Kitchens, which trains and employs formerly homeless New Yorkers. Time expired. Thank you, Allison. Uh, how much more you have to go? I'm not much longer. Go ahead. A minute. Okay. Yeah. So um, at a time of our heightened food insecurity, we're now providing more than 5,000 daily meals to residents of shelters and tra transitional housing across the city. As unemployment remains high and the city's economy struggles to recover, the need for continued support for workforce development is especially critical. Project Renewal strongly supports the Department of Veterans Services and values our role as a partner in its mission. And we look forward to working more with the department and welcome suggestions for further to a greater partnership in the future. In addition, during this unprecedented time, we call on all New Yorkers to show compassion for our neighbors experiencing homelessness, mental health concerns, substance use disorders, and unemployment. Each of these individuals is a human being with a story behind their complex challenges, and they deserve all of our support, especially the veterans who have sacrificed so much to help our country. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Thank you for that beautiful, informative, and um, heartfelt um, testimony. And I couldn't cut you off. Mm -hmm. I can let you finish. It was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all the, the great work you do on behalf of uh, Project and your Thank you. Next, we have Ashton Stewart. Starting time. Good afternoon. Um, can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, thank you, Chair Deitch and members of the Committee on Veterans for this opportunity to testify. Um, we really appreciate your support. Um, uh, Sage Vets is a program for New York State veterans uh, who are LGBT and 50 years or older. Um, it's part of Sage, which has been around since 1978. It's the largest organization dedicated to improving lives of LGBT adults um, that was founded in New York City in 1978. Um, a lot of the issues that we're facing are uh, were expressed by DVS. Thank you, Commissioner Endon, for, for identifying many of them. Um, Sage Vets was created to identify support and improve access to care among LGBT older veterans across the state and respond to the swelling needs. And in fact, last year alone, Sage Vets outreach and program activities reached over 13,000 individuals, 3,185 of whom are veterans. Um, in recent months, our city and state has struggled during the pandemic and our elders have been forced to endure unimaginable hardships um, for LGBT elders and older LGBT veterans, many of whom are already struggling with financial insecurity, food insecurity, acute social isolation, um, has ex been exacerbated by uh, health disparities presented by the pandemic. Isolation is the underlying root of most of these challenges. Um, and while the issue of loneliness is something that older LGBT people have historically had to face, the current reality of sheltering at home has resulted in isolation issues that permeate the entire veteran service safety net. Um, that means basically that uh, other providers are working from home as well and struggling to figure out how to deliver their services. So in response, Sage Vets has conducted a vigorous wellness check program um, to make sure that we are reaching our veterans. Um, we do have the same issues with a lot of our older uh, veterans who do not use email or making telephone calls and printed newsletters, um, our way of 
communicating and staying in touch with those veterans. Um, we also have uh, Sage Connect, which is a new program to provide a little bit of uh, social support for veterans. We also started to do our veteran support group um, telephonically. Um, and the other thing is our legal needs, uh, as we are a legal referral program, um, have escalated. Um, we don't hear a single faceted problem from veterans they, like we used to. They call now with like a list of things that they need help with. Um, and we've really seen a, a big escalation in the legal needs of elder LGBT veterans that started at the beginning of the pandemic. Last year, we made 44 legal referrals and 26 of those were between March and September. Um, and given the reduction in staff at a lot of the legal providers, we've had to be a little innovative um, in our approach. We've been getting a lot of legal counsel from uh, legal partners such as the State Division of Veterans Services. I'm Balls. Okay, thank you. Can I just have another couple of minutes? Uh, one minute, maybe. Um, so uh, one in particular was a guardianship case that we had to put together. Uh, a guardian was not doing the, the, the right service for uh, elder LGBT uh, Vietnam veteran. Um, so we put together an order to show cause with counsel provided by the State Division of Veteran Services and successfully got a hearing at the State uh, Supreme Court. He now has a new guardian. Um, we also are helping a veteran who reached out to us after hearing about the Restoration of Honor Act, who is in desperate need of health care and, and eligible because he has another than honorable discharge and was discharged a few months shy of the two year period, what you were supposed to um, achieve to get uh, access to the VA. We are going uh, up to the state level right now and pursuing that to get him the health care he needs. Um, we're just so grateful for the support. And I just wanted to mention um, a couple of notes here. There was a, a bill that's in the state capitol right now where DVS is being asked to share DD-214s with veterans in New York State. Um, I think that maybe it would be interesting to find out if they are, have access to these DD-214s. Do they also have a list of all the veterans in New York State, including New York City? Um, that bill is S. 7051A um, in an assembly A0, A8002A, uh, sponsored by Brooks and Jean Pierre, um, uh, Senator and Assembly Member, rest respectively, there. Um, and the Restoration of Honor Act is a way of finding these veterans who don't yet identify or wear their identity as a veteran. Those who are discharged with other than honorable discharges for sexual orientation or gender identity, military sexual trauma, TBI, or PTSD. We're hearing from veterans already who are reaching out to their elected officials and then they're referring them to us. I think this is such an opportunity to promote this legislation to find those veterans and um, maybe increase the, the database that we're all working with here. The last thing I'm going to say is Veterans Day is coming up. We are preparing a big program to address some of the history of the discrimination that's occurred in the military and the huge progress that the US military has gone through with the ending of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And the committees that we're serving on as SAGE vets, we're encouraging those leaders of those committees to further diversify and then make sure that women veterans, LGBT veterans, and Black veterans are all seated at the table to make sure that we're all getting represented equally. Thank you so much for this opportunity, and I'll leave it, leave it at that. Thank you, Ashton. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to remind all council members if they have questions for panelists uh, to use the raise hand function in Zoom. Uh, our next panelist will be Ryan Foley. Starting time. Hello, Chair Deutsch, council members and staff. Good afternoon. And thank you for this opportunity to speak to the Veterans Committee about the needs of veterans during COVID-19. My name is Ryan Foley, and I am the supervising attorney of the Veterans Practice at New York Legal Assistance Group, NILAG, a nonprofit law office dedicated to providing free legal services and civil matters to low-income New Yorkers. Given the level of need in New York City's diverse veteran population, NILAG operates two veteran-specific legal programs. Our Legal Health Veterans Initiative operates legal clinics within the Bronx and Manhattan VA Medical Centers, including the nation's first legal clinic focused entirely on women veterans. Our Veterans Practice, is a community-based program with a large referral network that provides comprehensive services to veterans and their families, regardless of their discharge status and eligibility to use the VA healthcare system. NILAG is grateful to the city of New York for its investment in legal services for veterans over the past several years. NILAG has been the recipient of funding through the Legal Services for Veteran Initiative since its inception 
and has assisted veterans with thousands of cases in the areas of veterans benefits, public benefits, housing, consumer protection, advanced planning, and many more. Recently, NILAG was granted funding from NYC's Department of Veterans Services to assist veterans who require discharge upgrades due to receiving less than honorable discharges for issues such as their sexual orientation, sexual trauma, or traumatic injury. Still, services for veterans have not been spared from budget cuts implemented during this difficult time. NILAG's legal services for veterans funding was slashed by 32% in this new budget, which will allow us to serve fewer veterans this year, despite the many obstacles they face every day especially in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19 has certainly brought new challenges, but more so it has compounded the already serious economic and mental health challenges that New York's veterans faced prior to the pandemic. NILAG provides legal assistance to low-income veterans and their families because we know as a poverty-fighting tool, it works. Benefits and claims assistance is the top cited need for veterans and military households. 71% of veteran and military households have experienced a civil or legal problem in the last year. And the most common civil legal issues faced are eviction and foreclosure, benefits access, child support, and license restoration. Yet despite the significant need, 88% of low-income veterans and military personnel reported it receiving inadequate or no professional legal help for their civil legal problems. NILAG and our legal service colleagues throughout the city attempt to fill the gap, though limited funding keeps us from fully closing it. Despite resource constrictions, we have made every effort to meet the initial challenges caused by the pandemic. At NILAG, we established a COVID-19 legal resource hotline to provide answers to pandemic-related legal questions. Through this hotline, we have assisted more than 2,000 individuals and their families, including veterans, with advanced planning, unemployment and public benefit issues, and housing concerns, among many others. On the national stage, in mid-March, we led nation nationwide advocacy efforts to demand the VA take quick and decisive action to preserve veterans' health and benefit rights during the pandemic. I'm housing expired. remains there for May I have another minute? Housing remains the foremost critical issue for veterans. While some progress have been made towards ending veteran homelessness overall, shelters have seen a rise in veterans during this national emergency. With estimates that nearly 25% of New York City renters not current on rent, much of the burden of addressing eviction prevention and preventing veteran homelessness from increasing will fall on legal service providers. Employment issues are another high area of concern. Approximately one third of the callers to NILAG's COVID-19 hotline came to us because they have lost their jobs or cannot safely return to their jobs due to the pandemic and require assisting navigating unemployment benefits and paying rent and bills. Based on an analysis of industries hit hardest by COVID-19, it is estimated that 14% of all veterans employed before the pandemic have lost work. Since veterans begin their careers later and have an education and career background that doesn't always translate to civilian employment, on average, it often takes longer for veterans to find new work. These veterans will need legal advocates to help them navigate the unemployment system and to access via education, job training, or monetary benefits until they can get back to work. To address these critical needs, it's essential that the city council and the administration continue funding that allows NILAG and other civil legal providers to help New York City veterans make it through this difficult time. While we recognize the extraordinary challenging budget position that the city is in, it is essential that veterans have access to quality, free civil legal services. And as New York works to recover from the impact of COVID-19, civil legal services will be a crucial component to helping veterans get back on their feet. And city support for civil legal service organizations will make the difference for veterans who need an advocate on their side. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today. We look forward to engaging in further discussions about serving our veteran communities and improving their access to critical legal services and other resources. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. The next panelist will be Peter Kempner. Thank you. My name Starting is Peter time. Kempner. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Peter Kempner, and I am the legal director at Volunteers of Legal Service, also known as VALS. VALS was established in 1984, and our purpose is to leverage private attorneys to provide free legal services to low-income New Yorkers to help fill the justice gap. We thank the City Council for holding this hearing to examine the needs of veterans in the wake of COVID-19. My testimony focuses on two legal issues faced by New York City veterans in the wake of the crisis and, more important, and, and how it is more important than ever to ensure that veterans have access to free legal services in order to fend off potential devastation 
these two issues are eviction and homelessness prevention. And the second is end of life planning and planning for incapacity. Prior to the COVID-19 outbreak, Vols Veterans Initiative conducted free weekly legal clinics at the Manhattan VA Hospital, where we provided free le civil legal services to low income veterans aged 60 and over. After the crisis shut down the VA hospital to outside visitors, we moved our services online and launched a legal telephone hotline for low income elderly veterans. The number one legal issue faced by veterans we serve is eviction and homelessness prevention. Over the past decade, New York City, working alongside legal services providers, the New York City Department of Veteran Services, veteran services organizations, the VA and other community partners has made tremendous strides in addressing veteran homelessness using federally funded programs like Supportive Services for Veterans Families, hud Bash Section 8, the Grants and Per Diem program in combination with local initiatives like the Universal Access to Counsel program, New York City has cut its veterans pop homeless population significantly. This crisis has the potential to undo much of the progress we have made and return us to the bad old days where veteran homelessness was much more pronounced and widespread. It is estimated that tens of thousands of New Yorkers may face homelessness when the current pauses on eviction filings and executions of warrants are lifted. There is no doubt that there are scores of veterans amongst those facing homelessness and many of these veterans are those who are most vulnerable. They are veterans who suffer from service-connected disabilities, veterans with histories of substance abuse, veterans with mental health disabilities, and veterans who were formerly homeless. If evicted, many of these veterans will end up in shelters or on the streets. Homeless shelters have proven to be a hotbed of COVID-19 spread and may put these veterans at risk of death. The best way to prevent a backslide on veteran homelessness is to ensure that it does not happen in the first place. This means doing everything we can to prevent eviction of, of veteran tenants, which must include making sure that these veterans have access to free legal services in the event they are facing an eviction filing. It has been proven that tenants who are represented by counsel. Uh, Time expired. Can I have another minute, counsel Deutsch? Thank you. Uh, it has been proven that tenants who are represented by counsel in an eviction proceeding are much more likely to be able to remain in their homes, having access to counsel ensure that these veterans will be able to take advantage of the protections provided by the New York State Safe Tenant Safe Harbor Act, and they will be able to better access grants and other programs to help them pay off rent arrears and will ensure that their rights are protected. The next issue I want to address is to make sure that the veterans who are most vulnerable to poor health outcomes if infected with COVID-19 can engage in proper life planning. A core part of our work is to provide free wills and advanced directives to low-income senior veterans. These are critical documents to ensure that the wishes of senior veterans are clear and they're carried out by the people that they love and trust the most. Veterans infected with COVID-19 may find themselves in a medically induced coma on a ventilator for weeks or months. And during this time, their rent will go unpaid, bills will pile up, and loved ones may be forced to file costly and unpleasant legal proceedings like a guardianship if a veteran is placed, is completely incapacitated in the long term. A veteran who has the ability to put in a proper, a proper plan by completing a power of attorney, a healthcare proxy, and other advanced directives can ensure that the negative collateral consequences of incapacity are minimized and potentially avoided. By empowering their loved ones with the proper tools to handle their affairs while they battle the virus, they, will be, they can focus on healing instead of worrying about whether they will have a home to return to when they are released from the hospital. The common thread that brings these issues together is how access to free legal counsel is transformative for veterans in need. From eviction prevention to life planning to accessing government benefits and on so many other fronts, having access to free legal services is an important tool in our toolkit to help abate the negative impact of, COVID of the COVID-19 crisis on the New York veteran community. Thank you for allowing us to submit this testimony and for, for holding this important hearing. Uh, thank you, Peter. Thank you for the, the testimony. Thank you. We will, uh, not seeing any hands, we will now move to panel two. Panel two will consist of Avi Gross and Tamaka Tawaki, oh, excuse me, Tamaka uh, Tawa, Kawamatsu, excuse me if I mispronounce your name, and Kosing 
tech talk. And we have Avi first. Avi Gross can go first. Morning time. Thank you, Chair Deutsch, Council Members Amprey Samuel and Vulong. In my more than two years military service, I encountered a lot of darkness. For the first time in my life, I encountered hatred from people whose sole purpose it was to inflict harm and destruction on others. I also encountered severe social injustice when people were deprived of fundamental human rights. But worst of all was what every soldier unfortunately encounters in the military, which is an extraordinary indifference to human suffering, especially from those public officials with the resources and mandate to, to help those that are suffering and can help those that are suffering but choose not to. All of the indifference to human suffering that I encountered in my military experience is dwarfed in comparison to the extraordinary indifference to human suffering myself and my ill mother continue to experience from New York City housing agencies. It takes respectfully an extraordinary degree of cruelty to observe another human being suffering during the pandemic and choose indifference over compassion, common sense, and the screaming interest of justice. From September 23rd, 2019, when I was first forced into public shelter as a direct result of the unconscionable conduct of our city agencies, I've been battling on and off homelessness, along with many other troubling issues. The reality is that hundreds of vacant apartments for which I am eligible, based on any standard of calculation, those solutions are readily available. But the indifference to human suffering by clear and convincing evidence is motivated simply by a breach of integrity of public officials who are aware of the problem, who see the problem, but who refuse to intervene. I'd just like to share two examples of quotes that were issued by the housing agencies. The commissioner, Louise Carroll, on May, 30, on May 30th, 2020, um, released in a public statement, this is a time to help families out of the shelter system in a bigger way than we've done before. And then on I'm April, inspired. I'd just like to complete this point, please. Um, may I? She wrote, we are pleased to introduce new changes to the Housing Connect lottery process aimed at moving New Yorkers into stable, affordable housing as quickly as possible during the COVID crisis and beyond. We are committed to working with developers and marketing agents to expedite the leasing of developments while maintaining a clear, consistent process and strong protections for applicants. Um, respectfully, honorable chair, anyone, any reasonable human being that just looks at the facts of my application and sees what happens, um, just very, very briefly, 99% of the applicants were rejected except Almost all of the apartments have gone to family, friends, and un other unqualified candidates. Anyone who looks at these facts is deeply disturbed how this could happen. How this could happen to someone who's a law-abiding citizen, how, the, how people could be so indifferent during the pandemic. Here, and this is my last point. When the pandemic started and I was homeless, I reached out to almost every council member of the 51 councils. 90% of them unfortunately didn't respond. The most responsive council member from all 51 was um, Chair Deutsch, who um, I believe his name was Mr. Plushnik, who reached out, who took a look at the evidence, who actually put me in touch with the lawyer um, and 
I am deeply grateful for that help. The problem is that th there aren't enough member council members like you, Chair Joy, because anyone who looks at my situation is deeply, deeply horrified. And I mean, the injustice is, is just incomprehensible. And I know in my heart that you are a person of integrity. All I ask for is the chance to communicate to you a harrowing social injustice that is respectfully motivated only by greed. That, that is the bottom line here. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your consideration. I forgot to mention that here um, uh, on the other side, you have the HPD project manager who rejected me after I was approved. And he happens to um, conveniently own a couple of those affordable apartments. He's the rule, not the exception. Thank you for giving me more time. Thank you for your compassion. Please find it in your heart to reach out. Uh, thank you, Abby. Um, I'm going to have um, my uh, my director of veterans of care, Joe Bello. He's going to reach out to you. I don't think you have been in touch with him. No. So um, if you could, uh, um, we're going to have to circle back and figure right away to get the information or um, we'll reach out to Jack. Thank you. Okay, we'll have Joe Bello uh, reach out to you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, Abby. Thank you. The next person on our panel is Tawaki Komatsu. Starting time. Um, can Mark, you hear where's your, where's your mask? Don't need it. Uh, but can, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so, Mr. Bo uh, Mr. Doish, um, I previously testified in your hearings. I've talked about the needs of other military veterans who live in the building in which I reside. Um, there was a death in my building on August 11th of this year. I think I've previously asked you if you could get me the documents from HRA to let me know to what extent HRA is responsible for providing oversight of Urban Pathways, the landlord of the building. The point is, I sent an email uh, message to Commissioner Banks, Stephen Banks of HRA, as well as Anne Marie Scalia of HRA on August uh, 3rd about the need for this disabled military veteran to have an air conditioner installed in his apartment. Um, however, the fire department came to the building on August 11th, broke down his front door and rolled out his body. So the question is, if people are coming to your hearings, are testifying lawfully, truthfully in your hearings, and we're apprising you of these major problems. Um, why is it exactly that there's nothing being done? Um, also, uh, two other people, they told me of problems in the building. They told me there's a leak from the roof that are going into their apartments, damaging their property in the building. Somebody told me yesterday that his clothes are damaged because of a, a leak in the roof that's spreading into his apartment. I've reported this problem to HPD previously, repeatedly, and it's still an issue. So the question is, like I said, I don't mean to waste your time, but if I'm you know, advocating for other people in my building instead of myself, why is it exactly that there's nothing being done? Um, also, there was a mention earlier today during today's hearing about services for the underserved and I guess uh, employment assistance, uh, food assistance for military veterans, that's just not happening. Um, with regards to services for the underserved, I previously testified to you that I was assaulted in the building in which I reside. I reported that an attempted assault against me to Molly McCracken of Services for the Underserved on May 12th of 2016. Nothing was done, so I got 15 punches to my left temple on July 2nd of 2016. So I guess the question is, why is it exactly that the city of New York is continuing to do business with Services for the Underserved after I took 15 punches to my left temple only because no one from that organization intervened? I mean, am I out of line here or am I, you know, conducting myself in a lawful, proper manner? Um, so I guess to try to close out this testimony, can I get a, a commitment, a firm commitment from you today during this hearing to have uh, proper assistance provided to other military veterans in my building? That's a fair question. Talkie. Yeah, okay, so Tawaki, first of all, I asked the questions. Um, I heard what you said and I oh, told them in the past. Thing, 
Mr. Duke, I, I, respect, I, I, I heard you in the past, and I asked you just to have those tenants reach out to my office. And I have a uh, outstanding person, Joe Bello, who will help them. And as far as I know, that the other tenants in the building are not looking for an advocate, um, not looking for you to talk on behalf of them. So, and I told you every hearing that you need to have them reach out to me directly. This way, I, I did. did first but from them. This person passed away. He's dead. He cannot reach I, out to well, you. Well, I have. Well, unfortunately, that if a person passes away, they can't reach out to me. But I told you back in 2016. Uh, to you. He, I mean, he got your voice. Reach out to me. So I uh, appreciate it. Anyway, uh, if there's any report. issues, you can send an email. We always respond. Thank you so much. Anybody else? I think that concludes public testimony. Uh, if we've inadvertently missed anyone uh, that would like to testify, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we will call you in the order your hand is raised. Not seeing any raised hands. Chair Deutsch, we have concluded public testimony for the hearing. You I want to thank, I, want, I just want to uh, thank all the advocates um, who took the time to testify, although they didn't have to take the train or a car or a bus to come down to City Hall and not to go look for parking or to take the hassle of uh, public transportation that we have now. But I just want to thank everyone for taking the time. I want to thank also my colleagues uh, who've been on, in particular, um, Alika Amphi Samuel, whose husband is a veteran, uh, for being on this hearing from beginning all the way to the end. So thank you, Alika, uh, for being on. And uh, once again, I want to thank all the advocates and continue doing the great work that you all do on behalf of the veterans. And uh, I just want to mention again to uh, Avi um, that we'll circle back with you. We'll have Joe Bello. I'm sorry what you what you you're going through, but we'll have Joe Bello reach out to you. And uh, if you have my email on hand, you could just shoot me an email, and I'll send it over to Joe to reach out to you. But when it comes to anyone, especially your veterans, you reach out to my office. Um, I think that everyone gets a response from me. Um, I monitor my emails myself and, and uh, I have a great staff. I wanna thank my staff, my entire staff for always being available. Um, you know, people say, oh, we're working from home, we're working virtually. It's, it's sometimes it's a, it's, a, it's a lot more difficult being home and staying home and not being able to go out and being quarantined most of the time than running around and being in the office and being out and about. So I wanna thank my staff once again for all of the work that they do, um, literally 24 seven. You know, there's no time limit of, of when our jobs, when our work ends, because people are suffering, people need help. And uh, the only thing we can do is respond and try to get results. Um, and to the veteran community, hang in there and we'll do every, we'll continue doing everything possible for those who, um, gave us the, um, the American dream for living here in the United States of America, living here in New York City. So I want to thank all the veterans out there. Um, thank you. Uh, you're not forgotten. We appreciate um, everything you continue to do in, in helping other veterans getting the services and resources that they truly deserve. And we cannot, um, we don't know. I mean, if you're not a veteran, if you didn't serve in the military, you don't know. Um, the life of a person that served the military and that lives here uh, or anywhere in the world who's a veteran and the work and the things you have, you have seen throughout your life and, um, and the experiences that you had and some of those experiences no one should ever know of uh, watching your partners, watching your friends getting killed, getting shot in the line of fire. So I wanna thank you all and we do appreciate you. We appreciate each and every one of you. So God bless you all. God bless the veterans. And once again, God bless the United States of America. Thank you.